yeah! I am awake and alive and alive and alive. I'm so great, I gotta say it twice and cut it out once. My head's a syrup bottle that's getting tipped over every Wednesday. You're a storyteller in a storytelling podcast, and the only story you're telling now is a story about stories you don't want to tell! What the fuck?! Hey, what's happening, Mike Schmidt, 40-year-old boy podcast? How do I sound? Do I sound okay, folks? I hope so. My voice has been shot. It was all screwed up because I was traveling to cold weather areas. And cold weather areas, I don't know if you're aware of this, they have cold air prevalent. It's all over the place. Tons of cold air. It's lurking, especially in your lungs and throat. Because you have no choice but to intake the air and then expel it out. Well, when you breathe in cold air and then breathe out cold air, you know what it does? It freezes your vocal cords and you can't talk. You can't speak. So I actually had to get a uh, like a, one of those Hummer things and I had to go, I had to talk like that the entire time I was in Chicago. It made the show very difficult to do. I will not lie. Not because of my voice, but just because my arm got tired holding that thing against my throat. <laughs> Uh, do I sound okay? I hope so. Because again, my voice, I sounded, I had like a bubble in my throat the whole time. It was awful. Like a fucking Manitou. Like I had a, I had a fucking uh, uvula goiter. There's a good name for a band. Knock that, knock that down, folks. Uvula goiter. Uh, actually, that's a terrible name for a band. It would look good on a bass drum, though. Just because, well, actually, you know what? It would look good on a bass drum, but it would ruin your concert. Because for the first six songs, everybody would be going, I don't know what that means. And trying to figure out what it means. So you'd be playing to a sea of people staring at their phones trying to put together what a uvula is and what a goiter is and why it would arrive there and what it would look like. And then they would probably even Google uvula goiter. And no offense, I like your band, your music's not bad, but there's no way you're the top Google reference for uvula goiter. <laughs> you make your band that name and you're, you put out the best album of all time and you are still going to come in behind an actual uvula goiter and the second people see that, no one will have interest in your music. <laughs> Unless you have a song called Don't Google Uvula Goiter. Which Bloister called, I think that was, they had that, it was on the same ones, Don't Fear the Reaper. That was bookends, because that was the Don't Fear album, it was Don't Fear the album, Don't Google UV Goiter. Actually, it wasn't the Don't, it was the Don't album, not the Don't Fear album, I apologize. It's been a long time since the 70s, folks. Uh, but I was back in my ancient homeland of the 70s, I was back in the Midwest, I was there, I don't know if I mentioned this, folks, I was there breathing cold air, it was freezing while I was there. <laughs> Uh, it, I was gonna, we were talking about something and I was going to say something, right? Because, uh, look, all right, let's put it this way. It is Wednesday, uh, back to the regular recording day uh, here at Lily's house. And uh, I, I was, uh, I, I couldn't get off. I was like, I was caught on the, well, you know what I mean. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't start. I was not, there was nothing I could do here. <laughs> Uh, I was, I was just, I, I was here with no, I had nothing to talk about. I had, well, I did, I've got things to talk about, but I didn't want to dive in. And I haven't seen Lily in 10 days, low these 10 days. And so I had to hear all about her and what she's doing. And I'm, I'm sitting here wondering why she's wearing a poncho and hiding her breasts. I don't know why that happened. I walked in and she had a tank top on and I'm like, all right, well, this business is about to pick up big show. And then she immediately went and put a poncho on. Uh, and then she walked out and she tried to sell American tourists chiclets. So I was like, what are you doing? We have a show to record. Put that sombrero away. If anything, you shouldn't wear a poncho. You'd just be like topless with a sombrero on each boob. That would be, oh my God, how hot is that? There's a great act. Dude, you got to write a, uh, uh, an act to Guantanamera and just have, and have pasties that look like sombreros. It's perfect. I just wrote a burlesque act, folks. Huh? If a white girl does it, it's racist. Not at all. It's a celebration of the culture. And yeah. you like tamales? No. <laughs> uh, do you like tamales? No. I don't want to make that presumption. I don't. I don't know who you are as a person. I told Lily I was talking about Twitter and how I'm addicted to it and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm trying to shake it. <laughs> I, I find ways to get involved in things that I should not be involved in just as a way to avoid work and doing the things that I'm supposed to fucking do, as all of you know. So, uh, I, you know, I stopped buying newspapers. I, I think you know this. I used to buy five newspapers a day, uh, which made no sense because it was all five copies of the USA Today. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I could just read one, but here's the thing. I'm so weird. I must read a different section from a different newspaper all the time. And I know you're thinking, well, the USA Today only has four sections. Correct. So I would buy four separate and read the four individual sections. And then I bought a fifth copy to read that from cover to cover. I had to read it from front page to the back page of the purple section. That's how I had to work it. Is it still the purple section? I don't know. Here's why. Because I was at a hotel this weekend and I saw a USA Today on the counter, but I thought it was the shopper. Like they've changed their front page so much that it does. Because it used to have a very identifiable blue upper left hand corner and then red was sports yellow was money and the purple was the the pop culture section the life section now it, it had a black dot on it i'm like what 
So now you're just you're just newsprint? Is that I can't how do I how can I possibly parse together what I'm reading about without a color code to tell me what I'm gonna be interested in, you fucks? All of a sudden I'm looking and I start reading and now I'm into the money part. Where was the yellow stop sign? Where was the caution? That's why the yellow was green or the yellow the yellow was green. That's why the yellow was money. It was caution. You're about to get into bullshit talking about fucking Goldman Sachs that you don't want to read about. Um uh, and by the way, anybody out there who's listening to this show, obviously you're a normal person. You own a bicycle and uh, you like sandwiches. That's who you are as a guy or a lady. Perhaps you're a lady. You shave your legs four times a week, maybe six. It depends on who you are. If you're single, maybe it's one. Maybe or maybe if you're married, it's one. Maybe you don't shave your legs at all. Maybe you're a Bigfoot. Maybe I have women out there who are big feet who don't fucking shave themselves. And good for you. It's your body and I, I hear you roar. That's what I do. I hear you roar, <laughs> roar, ladies. Don't shave your legs. You are a woman. Don't shave your legs. All right. Or shave your legs. I don't shave my legs. I don't have to. I don't have like real hairy legs. I don't Let's pull my jeans up here and see if we can we get an opinion from Lily. See, I don't have like it's like there, but it's not really there. Um, but I mean, so I don't have like super hairy legs, and I'm I'm not like a super hairy dude. But I mean, I got hair in the places you're supposed to have hair, uh, and in some of the places you're not. Uh, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> um, as I get older, and look, we all know this. This is true. Uh, unfortunately, things start happening that you have no control over with your body. Um, so I get, I have like, I have a nose and ear hair trimmer that I bought, just to stay on top of it. Just because, because uh, let me put it this way, okay? Um, I. The second you see, because you don't even think about it, you don't even think about it. It's just a change that happens. All right, you're shaving, then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, there's a, a fucking porcupine in your nose. You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> Awful. So, uh, so I've always stayed on top of it. I've always done the best I can to stay on top of it. However, um, you 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 know you slip as you get older because you don't think it's going to happen all the time. And then you see, all you need to do is see one guy who doesn't take care of it. All you need to see is one guy. And uh, who who has a fucking tribble in his ear, and you're like, that's it, I'm done. I'm I'm gonna put my head in hydrochloric acid every single day. I want a waxed head. That's what I want. I just want a fucking mannequin head because it's fucking brutal. It's brutal when you see somebody who doesn't take care of it. Um, how did I get into that? I don't know. Like I got hair on my chest, and then uh, and then I I choose to remove hair from other areas, as you folks know. Uh, I actually did I did it a couple weeks ago. I went and saw our friend Renee. Uh, Renee is the uh, the wax dude. I called him up and I, I was so mad because I called him up and uh, we all know Renee, right? We, uh, uh, I talked about him on here. He's hilarious. So I called him to make an appointment and he's like, uh, I go, Hey, I've come to see you a few times. Renee, my name is Mike. And I just wanted to go ahead and make an appointment for next week. And he's like, uh, Oh yes, I remember you. I've always, I always remember you. And I go, Oh really? And he goes, yes, you're always so polite on the phone. And, uh, when you get a guy who's working on your cock, the last thing you want to be remembered for is being polite. <laughs> You want to hear, yeah, you've got memorable junk. That's what you want to hear. <laughs> but instead, I'm the nicest guy at the cock waxing place. That's not good. That's not good at all. I want a memorable cock, not a memorable demeanor. Fuck that. Unbelievable. So I was fur I was just uh, frustrated because, again, I and you know why? But you know why that's true? It's because you got a big dick. You don't have to be polite. You don't have to. So you can just call it and be a jag off and just go, yeah, it's me, horse cock. I'm coming in for a waxing. <laughs> Fuck you. And Renee will go, of course, please come in right away. <laughs> if I was Jonah Falcon, I'd be an asshole to everybody in the world. I would. And he is, actually, from what I've heard, but whatever. Um, such a shame that the world's biggest cock is attached to that guy. Like, he just doesn't deserve it. He's just so fucking terrible. I don't know who deserves it. I mean, I don't know what that means. Jonah Falcon? You ever seen that dude? He actually got, he went to TSA and they, they strip searched him and he tried to sue for embarrassment because he's got like a 15 inch dick. Uh, he's not a porno. That's the thing is, look, what a waste. What a fucking waste this guy is. He's, his name's Jonah Falk, and he's got like a 15-inch cock, and he had all these stories written about him and his big dick. But then, like, he won't do porn, and he doesn't unveil it or whatever. He'll he'll always take pictures of himself in like a Speedo or, or, a, or you know, boxer briefs or something. So you just go, Jesus Christ, why is there a child in your pants? Uh, oh which is fine. God. Oh, you never, you never saw him? Really? No. <laughs> what do you mean any of this? It's one story about a guy with a big dick. There you go. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, oh, I, that is horrific looking. Well, yeah, well, yeah, but and that's not even it. Like, it's not even you know, it's literally a forearm. He has a forearm, and is in, and, and you're just like Jesus Christ. And but if you're gonna do that, why the fuck wouldn't you be a porn star? It doesn't make any sense to me why you would just waste that talent. I told you, like I said, if I had a big dick, I would never wear pants. I it would just be, I would be that dude. I would walk around in bicycle pants the whole time and stop fucking traffic and go, yep. That's all I would do. I would wear a shirt that said, yep, that's it. I would wear boxer briefs and a shirt that went, yep, with a period. Yep. 
There would be no hyperbole. I wouldn't have to be hyperbolizing anything, and it wouldn't matter because nobody. And you might say that's a dumb shirt. Nobody looks at that shirt. <laughs> you might say the Yep shirt is dumb. I don't give a fuck. Nobody looks at the shirt because they're staring at the bike shorts, and I'm stealing money from a bank. It would be just. It would be as good as hypnotizing people. <laughs> If I had a 15-inch dick, I would just wear bicycle compression shorts, walk into a bank, everybody would freeze, and then I would walk in the vault and take a bag of money, and nobody would stop me. The only bad thing came when the cops would come and look for a description of me. They'd just go, all we saw was a 15-inch cock, and I would be in jail immediately. Oh, my gosh. Are you horrified, or are you just, you, you cannot stop staring? I'm horrified about so many things right now. <laughs> Oh man! So I called Renee to make the appointment. Are you all right? You're, you're gonna. You, I, we can take a break. We can take a Jonah Falcon break if you'd like to go ahead and stare at him. Uh, I ran an interview with, with him once, and he's just a terrible person. He's he's just not attractive. He's like kind of pudgy and and like weird, pasty. I I don't even know. Again, here's the thing: when you have a 15 inch dick, the incentive you have to groom yourself and make yourself look good to try to get dates is out the fucking window. <laughs> Because honestly, as long as you can line up some size queens, you're always going to get fucking laid. It doesn't really matter. You don't need, like I said, you don't need a personality. You don't need to be a nice person when you've got a fucking 15-inch crank. And by the way, I based this on the one guy who has a 15-inch crank because he's a jagoff. So all of my field research has been reading interviews with him and how much of a dick he is. And I realized, well, when you get a 15-inch dick, you don't have to work on your social skills. Why would you? Why would you have to? Because anywhere you went, anybody who had a complaint with you, anybody who had a beef with you, you just whip out your 15-inch cock and you just go, that's it. There's your final answer. And you tuck it and you get two hands and you put it away and you walk off. Uh, so, cause I wanted to get, I had to get waxed and it's so funny. Who is it who asked me, they were asking me why I get waxed and it was like, well, I don't know. I, I, I can't, uh, hmm. Cause I can't answer Cause I like it. I don't know. I just, if I don't know, if I would have known it was an option forever, I would have done it forever. I would have, I would have absolutely done it forever because it's like, you know what? And also part of it is not just because of the feeling, cause it, it feels clean. How does that, it feels like your cock just chewed gum. I mean, it's amazing. It's like the greatest <laughs> It's so fresh. It's just an amazing feeling. It's completely different. What? It's true. I'm serious. You know. Come on. You're waxing all the time. I don't wax anymore. What? No, I have hair. I Stop like telling hair. me these things. I don't want to know that. I don't like being naked. Yeah, no, but, we but born that way. Brain Lily is naked, so stop. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't want to hear that. Uh, ruining all of your fantasies. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, not all of them. Just three of them. But still. <laughs> <laughs> Not, you're not at all of them. No offense. You can back up a little bit there. I know you want to jump into the fucking swimming pool of my head and be involved in all of it, but you are in a tiny corner of it involved in three of them, and that's fine. Uh, although now you may have just been dropped from two of them. I won't lie to you. You may be in one. <laughs> two of them may have cut you loose now that I know that you're fucking not going bare floor, that you put the drapes back in. Why? Why did you pull the drapes? And don't give me that nonsense. We were born. There's like bullshit. Who cares? I was also born with a fucking cord into my mom's vagina. That's gone. <laughs> that falls off naturally. The hair on your vagina doesn't. Mm. Oh, well, see? But it does. If you would have left it there, you would have seen. And now it's back and it will. And then all of a sudden you'll be like, oh my God, what is going on? I'm naked as a mole down there. Yes, you are. Didn't even make the effort. Uh, I am so mad that you had an answer for the umbilical cord thing. I just expected, <laughs> a, I expected you to just go... Well, actually, you know what? You're, I, I thought that was the argument winner off the top of my head. I'm like, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's such a great, it feels, literally, it's like you soaked your dick in scope. God damn, it's such a great feeling. It's so fresh and awesome. Uh, and also, I'll be honest with you, you know why I wax? Here's why I wax. Just because, and this is good, oh, <laughs> this is not awful, but, uh, but I kind of like the idea that out there somewhere in the world, there's one guy who has to do that for me. <laughs> You're an ass. Oh my God. No matter how bad things go for me, no matter how far I fall off of my ledge, I know at the bottom there's a guy who's going to catch me and has to take all the hair off my cock. I know it. He has to. He has no goddamn choice. It's like somewhere out there I have a cock slave and there's nothing he can do about it. If I call him and I reserve a Tuesday block, he's he has bound and determined he has to do it. That's awesome. It's like in like Dungeons and Dragons where you, if you put a spell on some guy and then he had to follow you around and carry your pack, this guy's got to carry my pack forever. I don't know why I went to Dungeons and Dragons. Can you zombify a guy in that? Is there a spell of zombieing? 
Well, not ca- carriage. I mean, it, it, I'm, look, it's an analogy, all right? In Dungeons and Dragons, the guy has to carry your backpack and feed your horse. In real life, this guy has to take, you know, has to fucking wax me and get all the hair off my balls. Good for him. But isn't that power? That's complete power to know that somewhere out there there's a guy who's got to fucking, you know, hey, if I call him up and I go, hey, I'm coming in to show you my balls for two hours, he's got to do it. He's got to say yes. Granted, I got to pay for the privilege, but so what? Honestly, you know what I should do? I should just pay cash and peel it off like a, like a bucket of time and just throw it at him. There you go, cock slave. Take that. Although in the part of town where he works, I'm sure cock slave is a completely different meaning. So, And probably costs a whole lot more. Or probably for free, depending on where you went and what they were looking for. But if you were Jonah Falcon, everybody could be your cock slave, right? Right? Although, actually, let's be honest. Let's turn this around. Let's get let's get fucking metaphysical. Isn't Jonah Falcon really a slave to his cock? I think he is. <laughs> Does Jonah Falcon exist without his 15-inch cock? I don't think so. No. And maybe he'd be nicer to people on the phone. <laughs> I have no idea if he's mean on the phone or not. I've never had a phone conversation with him. Why would you ever have a phone? I, who would talk to him ever on the phone? Why would you? There's no point to even know Jonah Falk unless you're, you want to see it, right? Literally, I would call him and he would say hello and I'd say, is your cock there? And he would put the phone down there. That's it. <laughs> That's why I've called to talk, talk, talk to Jonah. You're a fucking asshole. I don't want to talk to you. The only redeeming quality about you or your entire existence is your fucking 15-inch cock. <laughs> oh, my God. How did I come up with him? Where did he come from in my brain? Him? He's a terrible person. Read interviews with him. That's the whole point is he's a jagoff. Let's put it this way. If you've got a 15-inch cock and all you do is whine about it, jump off a fucking cliff. Throw, you know what? Tie an anvil around that thing and throw it off the cliff and follow behind it. You don't deserve nice things. Like a 15-inch cock. I don't want to hear about the burden of your life, the burden of your existence, how hard it is to get a job. Oh. Fuck you, man. Fuck you. Go do porn. You could do porn if you weren't such a repulsive fucking person. If you get a 15-inch cock and you fucking whine about it, that, that's like having a fucking a Mercedes hood ornament on a goddamn Pinto. What the fuck? It's What a waste. It's a terrible guy. All right. Uh I've never met him, by the way. What is it? Everything. I'm just saying the way he purports himself in the media. He's a victim. He's a victim of his cock. Get lost. All right. <laughs> I read the story on him once, and they said, uh, "What was the, what was the that the heat coming off of his his crotch is it's like coming off of a uh, like a stove because you know you, unfortunately you need all the blood." And I just loved it. You know what made me laugh was that was the reporter's angle. Like that was the angle. He was like, when he was assigned this story, he was like. I wonder how much heat comes off that thing. <laughs> That's the first thing you thought. But then, you know, he's bitching about how he's like a piece of meat or he's just looked upon as that. You are. You're a piece of meat. You're a 15 inch piece of meat. Own it. I don't understand people who have built in advantages who can't make them work for themselves. Said the guy who was talking in a stripper's kitchen with a brain the size of a fucking Volkswagen. But nobody gives a fuck about a brain. I can't walk out and go, hey, check out the big brain on Mike. Nobody cares. Nobody cares how much heat's coming off my head. <laughs> Nobody's going to walk up and rub their hands and warm themselves on the fucking heat coming off of my skull. Oh my and it's prodigious, folks. Let me tell you something. If I'm, by the end of the show here, my head's glowing red like a fucking fireplace poker. <laughs> my head's glowing red like the hanger Kurt Russell in the thing used to show that the blood was alive. That's right. Oh. <laughs> you remember that scene? That was a great scene. I haven't seen that movie in a long time. Actually, I saw it a month ago. No, two weeks ago. I don't know. I'm an idiot. Why was I saying I didn't see it in a long time? Because I just saw it. That's why it was popped into my brain, I think. All right. Uh, hey, folks. So I'm back in America, or I should say <laughs> California. Um, and I'm here now. And I got here to talk to Lily. And uh, and we talked for the last two hours because we haven't seen each other in forever. And I was like, we should just record this and put it out as a show because it was so interesting. Both of us ripping everything to shreds and hating everybody. Uh, what were we talking about? What made me start the show? You go, let's start the show. Oh, that's what it was. Stop sending me game requests. That's what it was. <laughs> that's all. Uh, I feel like I've banned so many games from my thing that there no more can exist, and then I still get like three more the next day. I don't know how many Facebook games exist. I, I don't know. Well, I people will ask me to join them, and there's no way. There's another thing, too. I don't think anybody's asking me, Mike Schmidt, to play this game with them. I think they're just asking a thousand people at once, right? 
No. Yeah. Nobody wants me to play star clones or whatever the fuck and Farmville and yeah. but Farmville's like totally passé. Now there's all these other different games. And I but I will tell you this, I almost got sucked in to uh to Facebook. And here's how. I was I checked my email and I got an email from mlb.com and it said uh play the newest MLB game on Facebook and I went, "Oh, don't you're going to trick me to do this, aren't you?" <laughs> and I looked at it and it's a it's like fantasy baseball, like you build your franchise and you, and I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't. Cause I mean, I'll tell you what, if I get involved in that, you guys may never see me again. I mean, I'll be, cause I'm horrible. Like I, when I had, when I was playing with my Xbox, I have an Xbox 360 and when I was actually playing games, I would play for three days in a row. Like, I mean, I would, <laughs> I would play for 12 hours and then hit pause and save the game and then go do a job or something and then come home and play for like 12 more hours and uh, cause I would play Madden and I would, you know, build my own team and make my own uniforms and then uh, have a draft and uh, look, you know, what's funny. I didn't like any of the gameplay. I think I've told you this before. I liked all the surrounding shit. Like I want to, I want to play like executive. I want to be the guy who just puts together a team and then goes, go, uh, Oh, really? Um, <laughs> I want to be a guy who just builds together a Madden team and then says, go play. Like I, and, and I can, I can sit in the skybox with a cigar and watch them fail or succeed and then i would cut them all and fire them uh because i don't want to control any guys i want to control one guy the boss who then buys and sells guys um does that make any sense probably not uh basically what, so and what i'm saying to you is i don't like video games i think that's what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> i i do but i only like certain uh, elements of them all right um but if you're looking to hire somebody to write for video games, oh my God, call me because I've written for a very successful video game and then was dropped subsequently and I don't know why. Um, but I wasn't privy to the negotiation, so I have no idea if there was something made on my behalf that I would not have requested. I have no idea what happened, but I know we weren't invited back. Anyway. Um, so yeah, don't invite me to do Facebook games. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wanted to start the show was for that. <laughs> I, I think I just wanted to start it because we were talking, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Because it's just you just literally see the clock, the hands whizzing around <laughs> as she and I sit here and stare at her poncho. Um, so I'm uh, I'm back here, folks. I'm back in America, as I've mentioned. I was traveling. My voice is okay now. I think oh, I was driving. I I got a late start today because I was wiped out. I'll, t I'll tell you in a second. But I was driving over here, and I have to drive past two schools to get to Lily's house. There's uh North Hollywood high is by my house. And then there's a private school and I don't know. I don't know the grade range for this private school. I'm going to guess it's anywhere from kindergarten to seniors in high school. Cause it might be just like a rich people school. I, I don't know. It's tucked away in these bushes, but when you leave at a certain time, when I leave my house, both schools have let out so people are you know walking on the street and crossing the crosswalk and there's a security guard out there or a crossing guard and uh i pulled up out front of the rich people school and I, all right i should tell you this um this is gonna sound awful and please don't judge me but uh and again i'm an old man this is gonna sound creepy but they're like really beautiful high school girls and uh I told you, there's part of me, you'll, you'll look at them with this weird, like, oh, wow, that's hot. And then your head, you're just like, shut up and stop looking. <laughs> put, put your pants back on, Jonah. These girls are not, are not for you to look at or talk to. But it's that weird, I'm at an age now where I still look at them like, uh, wow, that's a fucking hot girl. And then part of me also goes, I want to protect them from the world. Like, it's that weird, I straddle that line where I don't want bad things to ever happen to them. And I, I'm... It's been a weird year, like, you know, because women have essentially been under attack a lot because of their uh, bodies and men are frightened of them. So they're told that they have to get abortions or they or, or that they have to ask if they want to get an abortion or they're told that they can't have abortions because the it's sacred life, whatever, the, all this bullshit that men have decided to tell women that they have to do. And I find myself everything I do is tainted by that. Like everything I watch whenever I watch TV, like when I watch The Walking Dead. All right. And I see a woman who's out alone. I, I go, well, she's going to get raped and killed. Like, I mean, immediately <laughs> that's where my head goes. I feel bad for women. And I this is going to sound awful. Like I because they're, you know, everybody says the fairer sex, the weaker sex and all those things. And I don't think any of that is true. I, I mean, I, like I said, women are brilliant and I think can handle themselves in most any situation. But at the same time, uh, if six guys show up 
and they are all of a mind to make you do something you don't want to do, there's trouble. And that's, that's the way it is with any group. Okay. I mean, it happens to men too. I mean, there was a story in Acapulco yesterday. Did you see that story? Six men and six women from Spain were on vacation in Acapulco and they had a house uh, and they were having a good time. And then five men burst in with guns and tied up the men and raped the women in front of them. Raped five of the women in front of them. The other woman said, I'm Mexican. Uh, and they said, okay. And they left her alone because she was from Mexico. And so they raped the five women in front of everybody and then uh, drank a lot of booze and hung out and then left. Didn't kill them, didn't do anything, just, just, they did it. And uh, so the governor of Acapulco, the governor, the whatever, the boss, I don't know what the fuck Acapulco, <laughs> literally when you read about Acapulco, I think they have a boss. They don't even have a president or a fucking, they, they just have a boss of the country. Uh, the CEO of Acapulco said, uh, it's not even a country, right? Acapulco is, it's in Mexico. Whatever the fuck they have, they have a, uh, there's a final boss in charge of Acapulco and they, I guess this is happening quite a bit over there. It's become a shooting gallery, just like the rest of fucking Mexico. So they want there to be more tourism. They don't want to fucking get these stories out there to where it turns into a huge thing in it. And it's already cutting into their tourism, but they really want to put a lid on it because apparently they have, uh, they're getting shootings every day and they're finding severed heads in the streets, uh, which I will tell you, none of your finer vacation spots have. <laughs> You can go to London. You can ride the tube. You can watch Buckingham Palace and the changing of the guards. You can look at Big Ben in Parliament as you drive in a circle <laughs> behind the Griswolds. And I can tell you right now that you're not going to find a pile of severed heads in Piccadilly Circus. It's just not going to happen. Go to France. <laughs> Check out the Eiffel Tower. Go have some horrible cheese. Make out with a chick with a beret. See the Champs Elysees. I can tell you right now, you are not going to find a pile of heads under the Arc de Triomphe. <laughs> Head to Germany. Go to any of your finer beer gardens. <laughs> Indulge in the local beverage. Have some knockwurst. Have a schnitzel. Have some spätzle. Have something else with an SCH in it. Or at least the sound of it, because spätzle doesn't. I can't, you know, I can't decide whether it's spätzle or spätzle. But it's Germany, so you can't go wrong with the shh, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. All right. Um, so, yeah, while you're eating spätzle, well, let's put it this way. You're not going to find a pile of shevered hedge. <laughs> Again, you can't go wrong with it. <laughs> and by the way, I have no idea why Sean Connery is in Germany. Shevered hedge. Ah, oh, Mishmani Uh oh my, my, my Sean Connery is an imitation of Sick Boy from Train Spotting doing Sean Connery. All right. Oh um, so, so I fear for women. That's just it. I mean, I, I mean, I fear for everyone. I fear for society. I fear for everyone because it's just all. I, and it's my own fault because again, I run around on the internet, and that's where I get all my news and stuff from. So it looks to me like everything has gone crazy, and everything's terrible, and every woman's gonna get raped, and all these. And don't ever like there shouldn't be. Everybody's like, oh, you got to stay in a well lit area at night. Don't go out at night. Don't ever go out at night. Stay in your house. That's well lit and it's got locks. Come on, ladies, don't make me feel bad for you. Because then I feel like I'm condescending, like women can't take care of themselves. But then I'll read some blog entry from a girl who was on the train and a guy kept hitting on her and it made her uncomfortable. And then she was walking past the construction site and she got wolf whistled at. And this woman's like, look, I'm a, a grown up woman and I can take care of myself. But at the same time, don't put me in danger with your your weird guyness. And so I don't know what side to come down on. Like I, I you, know, you can't coddle people and hide them for, away from society. You want women to be able to function and do the things that they want to do. You're a lady. You got breasts. Tell me what's up. Nothing? All right. My um, <laughs> well, I would know. Fucking nine layers of poncho. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know, because I don't want to be condescending like the guy, because I mean, I, I tell you I do that with Karen, where I just want to, she'll tell me a story, and it's uh, and it's 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 not going well for her in the beginning. And I, I look at her, I'm just, tell me the end and it's good. Tell, tell me that you came out okay in this. I don't need you to give me a long story where you're going to lose in the end. I don't want to hear the bad thing. Just tell me that you're okay. Because I... I uh, I, I've told the story on here where I dated a girl and uh, I was out, I, she was in San Diego and I was in Chicago and we talked on the phone and then she got punched in the face at a club and they broke her nose and I wanted to fly home and kill everybody in the city. Like I was just, it, and it wasn't even about her. It was more about me and my, my irresponsibility to protect her. And it's not my job. It's not my job to do that. You can't protect people from things that are happening. Uh, how the fuck? I don't even know how I got into this. How did I, what was I, what was I doing that led us down this path? 
Because I was talking about Acapulco. By the way, Acapulco is a re- yeah. Well, you know, it's a restaurant here in L.A. too, uh, Acapulco. And I, I'll be honest with you, getting raped by five armed guys and eating in Acapulco. <laughs> that's a coin flip. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's awful there. It's terrible. El Torito is at least sort of passable fake Mexican. You go to Acapulco and their food tastes like a gang rape. I mean, it's fucking terrible. And you pay for the privilege. Are you a stockholder? What are you doing? <laughs> You're freaking me out. Uh, all right. God damn it. You, that, that hit you hard. I didn't know you were such a fan of Acapulco and shitty Mexican food. Uh, have you eaten there? <laughs> Seriously. Well, what did you order? Because you obviously didn't order what I ordered. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what I ordered, my comparison is is perfectly legit. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know. I, so I fear for ladies, I guess is the proper thing that I was saying. I don't even know how we spun into this. I don't know how I got to talking about it. Was it something we were talking about? Well, yes, but before that I got into ladies and about how I wanted to, I was like, uh, I, think you wanted to protect those women. I want to protect all women. That's the point is I can't, I don't want, Oh fuck. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> all right. Cause I, I ogle high school girls, but at the same time I want to protect them from, from the world. Like I, I, cause I see them and it's like their body says, Hey, guess what? I'm available. But their handful of books says, leave them alone. <laughs> and also the, the, the fact that I need to buy an ear and a nose trimmer because I have tumbleweeds blowing on my ears tells me leave these girls alone. Cause you know who you are to them, sir. That's who you are to them. You creep. Put your eyes back in your head. We're blinders. And I always do the thing. I told you, I tell Cameron, it's like, it's like art. You're just watching art walk by. Yeah, but now I'm watching a painting in progress, and that's not good. That's not finished art. If art's in a museum, you can look at it. But if you're watching a painting being created, there's something bad about that. So, uh, and then also the fact that I have a niece who's who's getting to be that age. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, I want, it was funny. I, I talked to Mex about it. I was like, hey, so what's going to happen when she starts dating guys? He goes, oh, Val already knows. Just get the shovel. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> Because she was talking about, he was talking about somebody that she knows, and I said, "Look, you got to tell me that that turns out okay, because I don't want to fly back here and have to kill people. Because I mean, I, I will. It'll be awful. I can't even imagine what's going to happen when she gets some boyfriend and the axis of evil rolls over to the house to have our first interview with him. Sit down and be like fucking Tony Soprano and Big Pussy and fucking Paulie Walnuts, just having a chat with some young local fucking kid. Oh God! And that's who we are. That's that's what I'm saying. We're big fat guys in loud shirts who are going to make sure to scare the shit out of you. That's who we've become. God damn it." Because I like to think, I'm like, hey, I'm still sort of young, I'm okay, but I'm not, man, I'm not. I am so far from young and so divorced from that generation of young people. Uh, it was like Lily put up a thing on her Facebook page of some girl in a courtroom, and she was talking to a judge, and she was all flipping, she was like selling drugs, and then the judge was like mean to her, or not really mean, he was just a judge. You know why? That's what his job is, he's a fucking judge. And this girl's like playing with her hair, and she's being all cute and trying to be funny, and then she acted like an asshole in court, and then she gets sentenced to 30 days in jail, and I'm online, and people are like, oh, that judge is a dick. No, no! That judge is not a dick. But unfortunately, that's what the generation of people who are that age think. And I'm sure when I was 18, I probably thought the same thing. These cops are dicks. These judges are dicks. And now I'm 45, and I'm like, I, I, this woman deserved more than 30 days in jail. That's what she deserved. She doesn't even have to go to jail. She needs to be sentenced to that fucking school that they sent the baseball players in into a league of their own. <laughs> she needs to be t- some uptight old lesbian and do ballroom dancing until she learns to respect somebody. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You're going to send her to jail? Fuck that. Send her somewhere where they teach her how to eat with a salad fork. That's what I want. Teach that girl some manners. My fair lady, the shit out of that girl. Maybe she won't be dealing Xanax anymore. Make her talk to two fucking cockney idiots who try to teach her how to say ta-te-ti-to too. And yes, that's singing in the rain. Not fucking my fair lady. I don't care. She needs elocution lesson. She needs diction lesson. She doesn't need electrocution in the goddamn jail. Fix that fucking chick. I even wanted to protect her at 18, acting like an asshole in a courtroom. I'm like, 30 days in jail, what are they going to do to her? Well, nothing. Lily and I were talking about nothing. They're going to do nothing to her. She's going to walk out of there even more mad at society. That's it. Doesn't fix anybody. So I was t- I'm driving today, and I see these girls. I see, like, young, and you're just seeing them, and you're like, ah, stop looking stupid. 
but there's still a part of me because it's like you know your dick and your brain are constantly in a fucking fight and it's just i you know which is fine and it's gonna happen for i i and honestly i hope it happens forever i don't ever want to hit a point where i my dick is has no say in the matter that would be fucking terrible <laughs> my dick is always gonna have a vote <laughs> i'm sorry my cock needs to be heard from at all times. He has to be he has to be consulted. I don't give a fuck what it is. I don't care if it's what brand of yogurt I'm buying or who the fucking stared on the street. I gotta talk to my cock and find out how he feels about it. My brain obviously will jump in and he'll try to moderate and mediate and all those other things that end with eight. But my cock still gets a vote. I don't ever want that to go away. I don't want that part of me to go away because at that point you just might just fucking roll me into a house and fucking have a, a, a big fucking Indian put a pillow on my face and smother me, throw a sink through the window and run away. All right. Uh, I'm hoping, Chief. So I'm seeing these girls. They're on the street, and uh, and they're hot. But they're not hot. They don't even know that they're hot. That's the problem. They're just walking. Uh, all right, shut up. Uh, but then, like I said, I'm I'm looking at girls, and I'm in my head. I'm going, wow, what? Because and also, I it, it doesn't hurt that I'm just I was for seven days. I, I went to the fucking Fortress of Solitude where Superman lives and froze my balls off for seven days. <laughs> and then came back here to where it's 70 and people are wearing like clothes instead of fucking saran wrap and coats. So uh, so it's weird. It's like, all right, let's put it this way. Everybody in the Midwest, you know how you suffer through that four months of winter, maybe even five sometimes. And then all of a sudden March and April comes and it gets to be like 50 degrees and girls start to maybe like come out wearing skirts or shorts and uh they, they start wearing those sundresses in like june and uh and you just want to pull up a lawn chair and watch girls walk around i mean you know what i'm talking about right okay well for me going home to the midwest for seven days was like that four months of seeing everybody everybody's walking around dressed like a barrel I mean, because they've got those giant parkas over fucking snowsuits over everything else, and they're they're just covered. There's layers upon layers. It's like, I don't even know how anybody in the Midwest gets laid anymore because by the time you're done getting undressed in the winter, you're fucking tired and you want to go to sleep. <laughs> you pick up some hot chicken zero degree weather. By the time you get to your place, you guys are spent when you're done getting your clothes off. And you just look at each other, and go, "Yeah, that's that's fine." <laughs> you nod off, and the sex would have been awful anyway because you've got zipper and button hand. You know what I mean? From taking off 80 buttons and un all these zippers and snowsuits and boots and unlacing everything. And by the time you your hands are just fucking gnarled in this weird position, you couldn't do anything with them anyway. And hands are very important in the sack. Uh, and then you're freezing anyway. You take your clothes off. Even though you got the heat on, you're still freezing in wherever you are because it's the Midwest. Unless you're fucking Jonah Falcon. <laughs> then you got enough heat for everybody. Jonah Falcon should move to the Midwest. He'd get laid constantly just for the source of heat he provides. Which I learned from an article. I still don't know why that was the angle. <laughs> Unless he's so fucking horrible that's like his pickup thing. Hey, feel how much heat's coming off my crotch. <laughs> Again, he's a terrible person. <laughs> so I'm uh I'm seeing girls walking about to and fro. Uh and it's that same thing, that same eternal struggle that I feel. But then there's a, I get closer to the school. And the thing is also with this school, because there's, like I said, kindergarten, it, it's all mixed in. Like you'll see some girl who looks like a senior in high school walking around in a cheerleader outfit, and then she's walking around with a six-year-old. And nowadays you have no idea if that's her kid or what the fuck is happening. So that'll take the fucking edge <laughs> off too. But I saw these girls today and they're walking and uh, in front of me was a truck with gardeners in it. And by gardeners, I mean guys who garden. I mean, I just like... <laughs> And good for them, and I'm glad that's a job that they can do and that they love, but I, I have no interest. You know me, I hate grass. I don't like bushes at all. Uh, case in point, we talked about earlier. <laughs> I don't like real or metaphorical bushes at all. Clean it up. Wax that yard. Get them the fuck out of here. <laughs> so uh, these gardeners are, are driving in their filthy truck with a rake in it, and... Uh, they pull over. There's like high school girls like standing on the side of the road. Many might not even been high school girls. Again, in California, you don't know. <laughs> in the Midwest, it's all corn-fed girls, and you're like, you can kind of tell the difference because they have that shiny face. But like here, man, you'll see like girls that uh, they might be 12, but they already got a rack and they're dressed incorrectly, and it's just it's it's rough. 
Um, but again, my dick doesn't have a calendar. So, I mean, I, I, I just, you turn your head and you look at him, but then when you see your face and you go, oh, okay, that's, I got to stop. Um, but these gardeners pulled over to talk to these girls. And, uh, you know, they're, they're in their fucking gardener jumpsuits and the balls. Like, I, I mean, seriously, I don't, what kind of game could you possibly have when you reek of fertilizer? You, you have no game. You have no money. You have a beat up truck and your job, your entire life's existence is dependent on rich people hiring you to do the shit they don't want to do. And yet you think it's okay to pull up and start talking to these girls. And the worst part is the girls started like talking back to them. Like they kind of, you saw that demeanor where they kind of loosened up. And, uh, and I, I wanted to, I wanted to pull over and like save the girls from these dudes. And I know that that's such a, a, a parochial mindset because, and then part of me is like, well, maybe they know them. Maybe it's like their cousin or their brother or somebody, but the whole thing, but again, it's so I can only make it sexual in my brain. So I'm thinking that they're, they're trying to mack on these girls and pick them up. And I a was horrified by the fact that they had the gall to think that they could step up and get those girls. <laughs> but also the fact that they would even bother because it's so obvious that these girls are in school and they have books and gardeners have never seen books. I think we all know that. Correct. <laughs> if they had ever seen books in their lives, they wouldn't be fucking gardeners. Correct. <laughs> and so I'm, so I'm pull, I'm driving and in my head, I'm like, I honestly had that weird battle in my head where I was looking at them and I was like, Oh, and then the guy pulled over and I'm like, no, you don't get to talk to them ever. And part of me was like, am I jealous because they get to talk to them and I don't, or am I really trying to be protective of them? I couldn't figure out how, my emotions at the time. Uh, but you know what? It, it, but honestly, when I thought about it, as I was driving, cause I left them, I didn't do anything. I didn't pull over like an idiot, but cause again, like I said, it could have been a brother. It could have been a cousin. Maybe he's negotiating to go ahead and, and work at their house. I have no idea, but it boiled down to one phrase. Honestly, as I was driving, I kept thinking about it and uh and i was it just made sense to me at the time there's some lawns you don't get to mow <laughs> and i think that's good philosophy for all of us when you really think about it it comes it gets right to the heart of it in life there are some lawns you just don't get to mow Hi, this is fucking Brian Noonan. You know, there's a lot of fucking words I can't say on my very fucking popular radio show, but fucking Mike Schmidt doesn't have that fucking problem on his fucking podcast, The 40-Year-Old Boy, on the Mike Schmidt fucking podcasting network. He's so fucking lucky. Cocksucker. Breathe. Breathe in the air. I hate it, Sonny, don't care for share. <laughs> this is the 40-year-old boy, and coming up later, 12 inches, I'd have to fuck you twice. I, I said I don't know. <laughs> Lily said, are we ready? And then she pushed the button and pointed at me. Because again, I sat here uh, stalling, folks. It's, I, I don't even know how to explain it. I... I I wish you could go inside my brain and see what it is. It's like, I, I want this. Now this will sound bad and I don't want it to sound bad because I mean, I love doing this, but I want it to be over so bad because it's just the weird pressure of having to do it. And, and especially going in seat of the pants and not knowing what you're going to say. So then you're like, well, Jesus Christ, can I, uh, will I be able to, and, and this is going to sound stupid, but literally I do this every week. Where I'm like, God, can I, can I do that? Can I talk? Uh, and I, again, that's all I can do. Cause then there'll be flashes of me just going, fuck this, get out of the way. And I want to just kill it. Like, uh, <clears throat> I actually thought about having, I think I talked about this where I wanted to have like a mic at my house and just start doing like random stuff. And I'm like, Oh, they can't do that. That's fucking terrible. I mean, I, cause then it'd be awful. Cause then, 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 I don't know. Maybe I'm just a long form guy. Like a short form me would be awful, right? You couldn't deal with short form me. Yeah, but that's bite size and that's not me talking. But I mean, follow me on Twitter because I'm great. I'm not really great. <laughs> you know what? I did. It's funny you would say that though, because I downloaded Vine. Do you know what Vine is? Vine is video Twitter. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I only downloaded it because I read the controversial story about how everybody was just sending out tit pics. And uh, so, of course, the second I heard about that, I'm on board, right? <laughs> If you've got an app and all it is is tits, I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you just have an app called tits? I mean, it makes no sense that you wouldn't. But then I read that Apple has a rule against that. Like, you can't be dirty in apps. And I, I don't know why. Look, I like Apple. All right, I'm an Apple guy. I've got like six different devices from Apple at my house. 
Uh, but I will tell you this. I don't know why they are fighting the internet. You're not going to defeat porn ever as, as strong as power. That's how fucking mad with power, how hungry they are right now. Apple, they think they can defeat the internet and porn. That's not going to fucking happen. Porn will always find a way. Uh, porn is a weed. You can build a sidewalk over it, but the porn will find the crack and come right out of it. <laughs> Try, if you take anything from the show, it's this. Porn will always find the crack. So, uh, so I download Vine because it said that everybody's like hashtag porn, hashtag tits, hashtag, and it's because Vine is uh, video Twitter. Okay, it's six second video clips. That's all it is. You send out six second video clips with a little description underneath, and so people are sending out pictures of their tits or what. And I'm like, I'm in, I'm in. So I download it and I go on the first day. And I was uh, I was at the airport when I did it. This is before I left <laughs> last week. Uh, I apologize. I was at the airport. All right, who cares? I. I <laughs> I did it like two days before I went to the airport and I was watching it. And again, you, it, it's just like the YouTube hole I talked about getting, uh, getting lost in. Only this is a literal hole you get lost in. Like you just, you go hashtag porn, hashtag this, and you're just looking and then there's all these clips of people in their houses showing their tits or, you know, whatever they're doing. And it's great. I'm like, this is perfect. This is absolutely what I wanted. And a day later, like I'm at the airport and I go on and I start going hashtag tits and it won't come up. And then hashtag porn and it won't come up. And hashtag ass, hashtag cock, you know, whatever the fuck. And it turns out that I, so then I, of course, immediately scrambled to Safari and I Google it. And uh, Apple scrub, it forced them to scrub the porn from the app if they were going to carry it in the app store. And so Vine did. Like they went in and they erased any hashtag at all that would have anything to do with porn. And I'm like, well, then why the fuck would I have your, your service? <laughs> I don't need to see six seconds of anything unless it's tits. Honestly, that's the only, the only bite-sized video I need to see is porn or somebody getting in the ass or somebody blowing someone. It's like because like you did a hashtag blowjob and there were like per, a person. There was a guy getting roadhead. He just he he showed the road and then he showed his girlfriend blowing him and he put that on. It was six seconds of that. That's perfect. That's all I need because I don't need to see. Look, have you ever seen a blowjob that goes on and on on the internet? You're like, stop, enough. Give me six seconds of this and I'm fine. Because again, I'm in a public place. I'm not, you know, jerking off. I don't need you for motivation to jerk off. I just want to see six seconds of a blowjob. That's what I want to see. <laughs> and I'm that way all the time. Like I, I could be anywhere in a grocery store, in a fucking bank. I could be in traffic and you grab your phone. And you're like, hey, I'd like to see six seconds of a blowjob. Hashtag blowjob. And it comes up and you get to see it. The miracle of technology. When I heard that Vine was doing that, I'm like, these guys are going to make a billion dollars. And uh, then within a day, they, they fucking caved into the pressure. And now you go on there and it's all like, hashtag puppies. I don't need to fucking see your puppies. Hashtag kitty cat. I don't need to see that unless, well, you know, this is what we need. We need an alternative glossary for the porn on Vine. <laughs> sure. So that, I'm sure it's already started. Yeah, exactly. It's been a week. But, uh, but I mean, all the obvious stuff doesn't work. I tried. And then sure enough, there was an article and it said Vine had scrubbed all of the hashtags that had anything to do with porn. And I just, I don't need six seconds of fucking anything unless it's Roadhead. That's fine. Then I'm in. So I'm furious by it. But go follow me on Vine. <laughs> you never know what'll happen. Because I had followers. I signed up for Vine under my name with the 40-year-old boy thing. And all of a sudden, I had three followers in like a minute. And they couldn't know who I am. They're just following people because there's no, look, Vine is me, these three people, and eight people showing their cocks and their tits. That's it. That's, that's all that's on Vine. And one guy getting one very lucky roadhead guy. I love the fact that that guy downloaded Vine and went immediately, it had only been live for like three days. And he thought, hey, I'm going to tape my girlfriend giving me head on the road. And he put it up. <laughs> that guy's whole life has been leading to that moment. He's been on Facebook, he's been on fucking MySpace, he's been on Twitter, and he's going, ah, I just, all I want to do is show somebody six seconds of my cock getting sucked. That's all I want to do. Vine comes along, he's like, thank God, it's perfect. At least he got it up before they cancel it, so good for him. Because now his life's complete, he doesn't need anything else. Until they come along with something else, and something else will show up. Don't, uh, they got to make a porn Vine. But they can't because you can't. They said the Apple Store won't carry your app if it's got filth. Because I actually, I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, it was long nights in Graveyardville. So I'd go to the App Store and look for filth, like for filthy apps, like Penthouse or anything like that. Because why not? Why? Because ha porn is the innovator, as we've talked about. Porn always c comes through and, and shows you the way. So I, when I went on the App Store and I couldn't find any, I was astonished. I'm like, it just makes sense. But then, of course, it makes sense because Apple won't even put you in the App Store if you have filth. So we need to f invent an app. This is what we need, folks. We need to invent an app that's filth, but they don't know that it's filth. 
and then it'll come in like under the cover of darkness and then when you hit it you just it just spews filth into your phone <laughs> i like this plan all right um <laughs> That's who I am. I'm Lucy. You know who I am? I'm Lucy. Right now, I'm 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 looking for the get rich quick scheme. Because because I'll be out. You know, I'm going to tell you guys this. Uh, next week's show, I'm not taping on Wednesday. I'm taping on Tuesday. Guess what I'm doing next Wednesday, folks? And I'm doing it. I'm fucking doing it. I keep saying because I've had the opportunity to do this a few times, then I haven't done it. Uh, but this time, I'm I have to do it. Uh, I'm trying out for Wheel of Fortune next week. Fuck this. <laughs> That's how bad things have gotten. That's that's a Hail Mary pass I'm going to throw is to try to get on there and be funny and fucking solve puzzles. But they don't, you know, because they're looking for contestants. They never look for contestants in Los Angeles because Los Angeles is full of actors and fucking industry. So they want real people on Wheel of Fortune. And who's more real than me, folks? Come on. <laughs> be honest with ourselves. I'm here bitching about not being able to see six seconds of porn here and there. Sajak will get that, right? Vanna will get that. Man, I, I bought that Vanna fucking Playboy. You know, actually... You know what's weird is I looked at it in the store and then bought it. I was like, why did you buy it? It's already in your brain. You know what she looked like. You'd already spanked to it, but I fucking took it home and jerked off anyway. Um, and by the way, that came out when I was like 30. Everybody's going to be like, what the hell, dude? Really? Yeah, yeah. That's what happens. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not above it or, or beneath it, quite frankly. <laughs> Still happens. All right. Uh, that's actually why this is taking so long. I, it's, Lily, I have to use your restroom. Ah. <laughs> oh, 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 Poncho. Oh, Cisco. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so there you go. So that'll happen next week. Uh, I, I, I don't, and so they don't ever check in LA. They want real people. So I have to drive to a casino like a hundred miles away to go try out. And, uh, and I have to wear like a mustache. They don't know it's me. <laughs> no, they don't really. It's not, it, my subterfuge will not reach that level. Um, but I got to get it right. I'm funny. I'm smart. I know letters. <laughs> <laughs> I know R S T L N E at the end. It was so, to, to, I knew that before it was cool. Like I knew it. And then all of a sudden it became the thing where they gave everybody R S T L N E. Uh, and, and plus I have, I, I'm just going to walk in until the anecdote of when I solved that puzzle at the fucking Chinese nail salon and then went crazy. <laughs> I walked in, walked out. God damn it. They probably still talk about me in hushed Asian tones. By the way, that's my favorite uh, shade of blush. All right, so I uh, what was I talking about? What do we what do we start talking about here? No idea. <laughs> um, what you raising your hand? Are you raising your hand or not? No I don't know where we went. I don't know. Really? Yeah. All right. So, um, well, fuck it. I'll just tell you, huh? At the airport, the app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I pulled up Vine. Did I get in? Was I? Did I launch into Vine from the jump? I don't think so. It doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. People are just here to, you know what? This this is why the show is so long is because half of it is me going, hey, I don't know what I was talking about. And I only say that for people who are new listeners. Because um, I'll get a new listener every week and they'll write me and they'll just be like, I, I'm fascinated with the way your brain works. And then I'm like, how fascinated are you with the fact that my brain doesn't work? Is That, that has to be pretty fascinating, don't you think? Uh, so next week, yeah, I will be taking Wednesday off. I'll be recording on Tuesday because I have then on Wednesday when you normally would think I was recording a show, you will think of me in a casino with a vest on waiting to go and be a normal person for fucking three hours. Uh, I got to get on. I got right. I am great. Uh, I'm funny and smart <laughs> and I know letters. Why am I going to say that over and over? That's my mantra. I'll, you know, I'll get a t-shirt that says that. Actually, I'll wear my Yep shirt. And then I'll take that off and I'll say, I'm funny, I'm smart, and I know letters. Uh, <laughs> so, folks, last week, I was in, uh, well, not last week, up to last night, for fuck's sake. Yeah, I was actually gone a week because I flew out on Wednesday. I was in Chicago to do a show last week. Some of you came out. Thank you. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, there were mistakes made on this trip. I'm not going to lie to you folks. There were plenty of mistakes made from the beginning. Let's cover those. I sat down. Uh, first of all, the, the, well, all right. When I say there were mistakes made, mistake one, booking the show. Now, <laughs> it's never a mistake for me to go home to Chicago. I enjoy going there. I love doing it, and I love performing for you folks. But uh, it was performing in this particular venue that wound up being a mistake because I reached out to my friend Bert, who books, uh, all right, when I was the house MC at the Funny Bone in Naperville, Bert was the manager. 
he ran the place. And so he saw me and he was like, Hey, you know, you're, you're really good. Would you like to work here a couple of times a month? And I said, I'd like to work here every weekend if I could, unless I'm out of town doing stand up. And he said, done. So I became the house MC at the funny bone and that worked great. I met a lot of comics. I had a good time. It was really fun. And I got, a, I was really good friends with Bert. So we've stayed friends. And then I've worked for him in different clubs. He's had different incarnations. Once the funny bone closed, he started opening rooms in hotel lobbies and fucking phone booths and, you know, <laughs> wherever they could scrape a buck up from comedy, he wound up doing it, including he put me up at a bar in Bolingbrook once, which I was not a fan of because that's where I'm from, from. Like I say Chicago in the generic term. I was born in Chicago, but when I go home, nobody from Holy Cross Hospital is going to come out and watch me fucking perform. So I'm not worried about it. Okay. But if I go to Bolingbrook and I do a show, there are still people there who work on the government road gang and then they still hang out at Clementine's pub and then they're going to come see me and give me a rash of shit because they remember me as Mike from high school. And that's not uh, ideal either. By the way, the, the, Bolingbrook's a nice town. The government road gang is not the only place that's employing people. I mean, I, I don't want to say that. But my, my implication is that there are people who've never left. And uh, who was I just talking to who had a theory? Oh, Pat, my buddy Pat. He was telling me that he went home to uh, Pennsylvania, where he's from, and he would see people that had never left. You know, and he, he would go for a reunion or something. And he said, those people look 20 years older than we do. Uh, they're the same age. You went to high school with them, but because they settled in there and never left, they've, you know, Pat is Dorian Gray. Pat has left. And so he's staying young by living a life somewhere else and seeing things differently than he always had. Whereas when you go home, you see people that have been there forever. I mean, and that's, I, I talked about this on here where Max and I, would go on Facebook and we'd be on the phone together and we'd go, dude, look at this page. Oh my God, look at this dude. Oh my God, look at this dude. And you would see guys that had completely bottomed out and, and you know, and then you'd read their page and then, and I, I will tell you this too, look, I, and this is terrible. I'm also a terrible person and I, I don't have pictures of me on my page. It's all paintings of me. So as far as people who don't, you know, <laughs> the guys who grew up with me, they go to the page, they go, look, this guy's so fucking horrible. He won't even put up a picture of himself. It's just fucking watercolors of what he wishes he was. And that's partially true, I suppose. I don't look young by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I look, I'll tell you, I look, I look much younger since I shaved my beard. I can tell you that. <laughs> I was shaving my beard. It was a thing for like two months. I'm like, yeah, okay, I can deal with this. And then when I shaved, I went, why the fuck did I ever have that hair on my head? I mean, it was stupid. I look terrible. Um, so uh, how did I spiral off into that? It's on Facebook. You see people, you know, and you're like freaked out because they're old. Whereas I'm just as old and I shouldn't be freaked out. Why should I be freaked out? <laughs> I just spent 20 minutes telling you I needed a deforestation crew on my head and I'm trying out for Wheel of Fortune. How much older could I get? <laughs> Jesus Christ, I'm going to have a bowl of prunes and some warm milk and put my dick in a drawer because I don't need it anymore. God damn it. I'm going to get my prostate checked during the second half of this show. Why not? <clears throat> that wouldn't be good. Um, there's nobody here to do it except Lily and she's not into that. <laughs> At least not for me. She may have milked a prostate in her past, but she's not going to do mine. Is there more uh, in a more unpleasant phrase than that, by the way? Uh, the internet is awful. I have found things that I should not have fi found ever. <laughs> prostate milking. Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, and people, where can I find that? That's my favorite part. Where can I find this? What do you mean, where can you find it? This is, there's some street corner shop where they're milking prostates. Oh, awful. All right. Uh, I, I, I've been to bad places. All right, so. Uh, eventually, you know what, eventually like a government agent is going to listen to the show and just go, we're going to his house. We're just going to burst in and find out what the fuck is going on in that ant farm he lives in. Um, where were we? Porn, hometown, old people on fucking Facebook. Uh, oh, so I went home <laughs> and I, mistakes were made. So I, I, I know Bert and I, I had contacted him and he was booking. He's always got a show somewhere. So. I called him and I said, hey, I, I wanted to touch base. And I've alluded to this in the past few weeks, but I'm going to elaborate a little bit more now because the show's over and nothing bad can happen to me. <laughs> uh, I called Bert. I said, hey, man, I, I was really thinking of coming to town at the end of the month and doing a show at, at your club, Comedy Comedy at the Shrine Theater in Aurora. Um, 
he said, oh, okay, well, when? And I said, well, February 1st is the date I'm looking at because it's right around Super Bowl weekend and I'll come to town and I have work that I have to do anyway in Chicago, so I need to be home for that. It would work out perfectly and I'm trying to get the show in shape for a CD. And he said, okay, well, let me take a look and let me see what I can do and, and we'll figure it out. Because again, here's what I did that was wrong. I immediately assumed he owned the place. I assumed my friend Bert owned, because I knew he didn't own the theater, because the theater itself had two spaces for performing. One was the stand-up place, and that's where Bert ran his show, and then there was an improv group that had the other theater, uh, which is, of course, awful, because all improv groups are awful. So, uh, and, I don't, and I don't say that as like a stuck-up comedian uh, who is in the war against improv comedy and stand-up comedy. I'm not a foot soldier in that war. I just genuinely know that all improv is terrible. So... Uh, yes, I know that's not true. Shut up. Uh, I, I, how many of you out there yelled freeze at your iPod right there to try to get me freeze and tag in <laughs> and refute my point? I'm sure most of you did. Oh, fuck. Uh, real quick, while we're talking about that, uh, Mex, I was at his house and he flips channels. He's the king of the remote at his house, so I have no say. So he stopped at that Justin Timberlake Mila Kunis movie. Is it, uh, oh, Just Friends or whatever oh it's called? God. Did you see it? Yes. Um, well, he's watching part of it, and his wife enjoys it. And I have to admit, I did not think it is as horrible as you did. I watched just a little bit of it. But there's this scene where they're in Times Square, and a flash mob breaks out. But the funniest part of it is, I was just talking earlier about how there's these niche things. Like, like uh, you know, on the internet, like I, like, I like the UFC a lot. But if I went up to, like, ten of my friends and tried to talk about the UFC, they wouldn't know what the fuck I was talking about. <laughs> Because it is a niche sport. It's something that I enjoy. Just like if somebody came to me about NASCAR, I'd maybe know some of the names, but I don't follow it and I don't care. But I like what I like and that's that. Well, the funny thing is when it gets to a niche and you're trying to talk to somebody about the UFC and then you have to explain what it is. All right. While at the same time, you were just trying to have a conversation about a fight, but now it turns out you are having, you have to define a sport for them, and it's very difficult. Same thing with movies or anything you like. If you like certain kinds of music, and then how many times have you told a friend that you like something, thinking they might like it too, but then they don't not like it, but they have no knowledge of it, so then you wind up explaining it to them, and you're like, fuck, I didn't, why did I even bring this up? You know what? Like who you like, I like who I like. Let's, done, let's never talk again. Let's never speak of this again. And then you run. That's the way all sh a conversation should end. <laughs> you should be talking and then literally turn on a dime and fucking sprint away. Sprint. I love that idea. God damn, that's great. Only for the chaos it would cause when you were driving in your car. And you'd see people on street corners just turn around and running. Everybody would be running everywhere. God damn it. Let's all get, that's how we fight the obesity problem in this country. Let's end all conversations with a run into the distance. <laughs> but only one of you gets to run. And maybe that's the first point of your conversation. When you sit down, right when you're about to talk, you just go, it's me. It's like, uh, you know, my turn or whatever. It's some code. We need a code. Hey, the guys who are making the Vine porn app, we need code for I'm going to run away at the end of this conversation. We need you to think of a word. <laughs> we need a code word. What could it be? God damn it. All right. Um, by the way, email your, me your suggestions for the sprinting away at the end of a conversation. Because You know what? Also, though, this would be a problem. Because Fuck a code word. Code words are out. Because if you were having a conversation and you accidentally used the code word, the, and then you didn't sprint away. The other guy would then sprint away thinking that he misunderstood and he would take off and then your conversation's over prematurely. We don't want that. We want long, fruitful conversations that end in a natural sprint away from one another. That's what we want. Not away from one another. Only one guy gets to run. <laughs> See what I'm doing, folks? I'm fixing the obesity problem. I'm evolving the art of conversation. <laughs> um... Uh, so we're, we're, we're the, I I, I kind of got lost. I won't I won't lie. <laughs> I got lost when I started advocating for people to sprint away from conversations. <laughs> what were we talking about? You don't know? Uh -uh. I don't know either. Uh, let's just go back to Bert because I mean I can't I can't even imagine what I was saying. Um, so I I said to Bert, I, you know, I want to come and do your your show, and I thought that he owned. The joint. Uh, so, oh, oh, I know what I was talking about. Justin Timberlake and flash mobs. So when you have to explain to somebody something, it's it's just embarrassing. So, but it's even worse when it's in a movie, okay? Because that was a movie where it's like you know these people are gonna fuck and then they're not gonna fuck and who knows. But uh, you saw the movie and you didn't like it. Woody Harrelson was funny in it. Every every scene I saw, he's like the gay guy who works in the office. He made me laugh. Um, because Woody Harrelson can do no wrong. We all know that, correct? It's like Woody Harrelson and Bill Murray should be in every movie ever made together just because they're great. They're awesome dudes. Have they made a movie together? Yes, they made two. They made Kingpin and then they made uh, Zombieland. 
Uh, and they're it's fucking fantastic. Oh, yeah, yes, you're right. Zombieland was brilliant. Yes. Kingpin was funny. Yeah. Kingpin is genius. Genius. There was a flaw in that movie for me. What's that flaw? I want to hear it. I demand to hear your flaw. No. You won't discuss it with me? How dare you say a perfect movie like Kingpin does not have a flaw? <laughs> Do me a favor. Tell me what you thought about Kingpin, and then just run, run out of here. <laughs> See, at the end of the show. doesn't it work? I, tell you and you run away. I should do that at the end of every show. Literally, the end of every show should, now should just be a sound of my headphones coming off and me sprinting and the door slamming. That's perfect. That's like new school and old school. Because it's new school because nobody's doing it, but it's old school because that would be something like Thomas Edison did when he had like a recording. He's like, dude, at Watson, check this out if I fucking talk into the microphone and then I split. Wait, is he Watson's his buddy, right? Or was he Sherlock Holmes' his buddy? Or is he both their buddies? Oh. Is it the same guy? Yeah, it's the same exact Is it really? That Watson is amazing. He gets around. <laughs> How great is that? Watson is a dude who fucking hung out with Sherlock Holmes and then he invented electricity with Thomas Edison. Or at least maybe he didn't. He was just his little squirrely pal with a mustache. But so fucking what? You know what I'm... You know what? Watson is history's greatest muse. <laughs> Watson led Sherlock Holmes to solve all of those crimes and then when Sherlock Holmes died in a fight with fucking... Uh, what's his name? Moriarty. He grabbed the slow boat to America and helped to find electricity. God damn it, Watson. Someone just makes just a movie called Watson. How interesting was that guy's life? And then all these people were named for him. David Watson, fan of the show, named for that Watson. Yes. Watson is history's greatest muse. All right. Uh, I need a Watson. You know what I need? I need a goddamn Watson. Well, no, you just told me you won't even talk to me. I asked you one question. You're like, no, you won't even answer me. You can't be a muse if you clam up. I can't be guessing what my muse thinks. My muse has to inspire me to greater heights. And granted, you do that within the context of the show, but then the second the show is over and I sprint for the door and I run outside, I don't see you again for seven days because you want nothing to do with me because I don't swallow swords. That is not it's true. totally true. Hey, Lily, you want to have some lunch or something? I'm sorry, I'm going boutonniere shopping. All right, good for you. Enjoy it. Uh, I'd love to, but I'm going to a fake leg convention. I'm hanging out with guys who say tee hee. And Kingpin, the yes. the star of the film, Randy Quaid. Yes. Why is he the flaw? Because I didn't care for him. I don't care. Well, he's for playing him. an Amish dude. It, it, he's just not funny. Hmm. Well, I mean, I mean, Bill Murray and what? All right, that's fine. I'm glad it burst out of you, like the alien out of your chest. If only Yafit Koto was here to hit you. <laughs> um. So anyway. So. Well, I hear what you're saying, but, I, for, but for me, Woody Harrelson and Bill Murray are the linchpin of that movie. They're the kingpins of that movie. Yes. And then uh, Randy Quaid is there to move the story along because he is the story, technically. Poncho off, ladies and gentlemen. Shut up. They want to know. I am one layer of fabric closer. Uh, and so are you folks, for that matter. Oh, my God. All right. Um, so in this movie, they go to a, they're in Times Square, and it's Justin Timber, Timberlake and Mina, Mila Kunis. I just fucked up two names in five seconds there. I'm distracted. Poncho's off. Um, it's hard for me to, I like that Poncho's off. That's a good code. I like that. That's the code word. That is the code word for when a conversation is over. And you want some, and you're just, when you show up to say that you're going to be the one who runs away, you just walk and go, Poncho's off. So then you, because you call it. That's like saying, I'm, I'm, you're it. You say Poncho's off, that means you are the one who's running away at the end of the conversation. I love it. Poncho's off. You know what? That's the fucking code word for Vine. That's the code word for the Vine app. Holy shit. I found, that's it. It's perfect. If you're going to put porn on Vine, six seconds of you getting blown in a car, hashtag Poncho's off. Done. Fuck Apple. I just dominated them. If Steve Jobs was alive, this never would have happened. But the man dies, and sure enough, Poncho's off. Hashtag Poncho's off if you want to put out porn on Vine. God damn it. Spread the word. Spread the word, and then fucking run. I need a network of fucking code word spreaders out on the street to just walk up to someone and go, Poncho's off, and then have a discussion. And at the end of it, you go, hashtag Poncho's off for porn Vine app. Run away. <laughs> Look at all the things I'm changing today. Oh my God. 
the art of conversation, porn on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so I called Bert and we're talking and he's like, and I, so I said, I want to come and do your space there in Aurora at the comedy comedy theater. And he, he, uh, he was like, okay, let me check. And he was kind of, I thought he would embrace it. But he seemed a little non-committal. But here's the thing about my friend Bert. I love my friend Bert. He's a good guy. But uh, he will he has a tendency to do that, where he'll just kind of like, eh, all right, well, let me see what's going to happen. And I'm like, well, what does that even mean? I don't know what it means. Just tell me yes or no. If you run the room, tell me yes or no. But uh, again, my problem was in thinking that he ran the room exclusively, and he was the owner, and he was in charge of that. But it turns out that he has uh, masters that he has to answer to, uh, namely the improv people who own the theater. And so he... Finally, after like three phone calls, I said to him, I go, do you want me to call these guys? Do you want me to email them? Because I felt stupid making Bert my pack mule because I thought he had the ability to just green light me. And I mean, he books the show. So he's like, no, I, you know, I'll figure it out. And, you know, because I will tell you from the time, you know, when I announced the show, I had been talking to Bert about it for three weeks, trying to get it nailed down and figuring out if I was going to be able to do it. Because if he could, if he would have said no, I would have looked for another theater because the whole point was I wanted to do a show Friday, February 1st in Chicago um, because I knew I was coming to town anyway to do some work. So he and I went back and forth and then he, and he kept coming back with counter offers. He'd go, well, you know, I do have another room. And it's funny if you knew my friend Bert, that's how he talks. Well, you know, I do have another room. I, uh, I, who's that? Does that sound like, not Casey Kasem, but it sounds like somebody else. It sounds kind of like that. I don't know. I don't do voices. Um, <laughs> except my friend Bert's. That's the only voice I can do. Uh, so he's like, ah, oh, yeah. You know, the thing is, I, uh, what would you think about doing another room? Because I do have a different, I have a different place. And so he pitched me on doing, he does comedy comedy at the tap in Oswego. Oswego is not far from Aurora. And it's just as, you know, let's put it this way. There are people out there who think if you're not in Chicago, you might as well not be anywhere out there, which is fine. I totally get that. It's not as bad as New York, but there there are people who think the city is the only place that you can go. And there are people who listen to the show who um, who wanted to come to the show. And then, unfortunately, because it was out of the city, they informed me that they couldn't. And let me throw this out there real quick. Um, there's a listener to the show, a woman named Maureen Boyle. And she came and saw me the last time I was in Chicago and was very friendly and very nice and uh, and could not have been more complimentary after the show. And then she stayed in touch with me via Facebook, like we all do, you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And she's cool. And we've talked a little bit back and forth. Well, then when I announced this show, she mentioned she's like, you know, I, I can't come to the show because of transportation and I'm in the city and, you know, going all the way out to Aurora is a thing. She goes, so, you know, what I might do is I may just console myself by staying home and ordering the podcast of the Caribbean set, which made me laugh. And I was like, uh, I said, well, uh, if you want to do that, that's the nicest thing ever, but you don't have to. And then the very next day she did. She ordered the podcast of the Caribbean set. So I can't thank her enough. Thank you so much. And and thanks to everyone who who's donated or bought tickets and, I'll, I'll you know, Here's the thing. I plug so much stuff at the end of the show and I should just ship those out and just thank people because so many people are so good to me all the time. Uh, our friend Greg um, just donated some money. I mean, you know, there's really nice people who step up. So thank you. Um, I, 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 I'm remiss in not saying thank you enough. So whatever. Um, so Bird keeps pitching me to go to different shows. He's like, ah, hey, you know, comedy, comedy at the Tap in Oswego. Well... I look up the tap in Oswego, and by the way, I sound smarmy. He's not smarmy. He's a nice guy. My, you know, check that. I don't do any voices. I thought I just did Bert. <laughs> Turns out I don't do that voice at all. Uh, but he uh, <laughs> he wants me to go do this tap in Oswego, so I Google it. Without you know, at first I tell him, nah, I kind of wanted to do Aurora because I'm familiar with the area in Aurora because it's uh, it's close to where I'd be staying. So I. Uh, I Google the Oswego, the tap in Oswego. That's a bar. Like it's an actual bar where people go. It's not a show place. It's not, I, I did a lot of that. You know, on the road when you're doing stand up, you wind up in a ton of bars doing stand up and you're competing with pool tables, you're competing with TVs. And, uh, you know, there, there are people there certainly who've come to see comedy, but then there are people there who have not at all come to see comedy. And it's, you're just, you're ruining their night. All they wanted to do was go out and shoot some pool and have some beers. And then all of a sudden, Jackass has to get up there and talk about what happened in high school. And they're like, get the fuck out of here. You know, uh, and I don't blame them. I want to give people the choice to tune into me or to see me. I don't want to fucking take them by surprise with a comedy ambush. 
check that. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to walk up to people on the street and go, ponchos off, and then just do my entire act for them and then run, run away. It's perfect. So uh, so I, there's nothing worse than that, than when people just go out to enjoy themselves and a fucking show comes up around them, which brings me back to flash mobs. Now, I'm watching Timberlake and Mila Kunis, and the thing is, they want to have a scene where a flash mob erupts in Times Square in New York. But if you don't know what a flash mob is, like I was talking about the UFC and things like that, if you don't know, then you don't fucking have any clue what's happening. So it's the most awkward scene because they're in the middle of a flash mob and it starts to unfold around them. And then Justin Timberlake is like, what is this? And Mila Kunis is like, this is a flash mob. It happens all the time when people, and they, they basically, while a flash mob is going on, they tell you what a flash mob is. And it was just so awkward and stilted and terrible. And I, I, I want to talk to the writer of the film because I know he's probably of a certain age and he knows what a flash mob is. And he wrote his script and he just had the flash mob scene. And then the director or the executives went, one of them, one guy in a suit, one fucking guy in a suit went, what is a flash mob? And he went and they said, well, no, it's, it's a thing people do where they're all meeting a certain designated space and they all do the same thing at once. Yes, Lily, you're raising your hand. Did you see the end of the film? No. Okay. It was all a setup for the end of the film. Okay. That's why it was in there. That's why she explained it to him. Well, I know that it. I, I saw another scene where he was planning a commercial and he was talking about guerrilla marketing late, this later on. And he's saying, I want to do like that flash mob that we saw in New York. Okay. Well, all right. Then maybe I'm talking out of my ass, but I'm still going to finish my thought. Um, let's go ahead. You're not talking out of your ass. Okay. Because. Even to get to the end scene to work, if you didn't know what a flash mob was, the end scene wouldn't work. Okay. So so, so I really like think that. that one fucking guy in a suit who didn't know what a flash mob was goes, what is a flash mob? And they explained it to him and he goes, well, you're going to have to throw that in there. And it's, I'm sure they all went, you know, aesthetically that doesn't work because they no one speaks like that where they explain to one another exactly what is going on in the moment. You would have said, what the fuck's going on here? You would have said a flash mob. And they're going, what's that? And they go, eh, a bunch of idiots show up and do the same thing. Like, I mean, but they were talking about it reverentially like it's the, the wave of the future of communication. Look. Look, flash bobs are no ponchos off. <laughs> the simplicity of ponchos off is a one man flash mob. He shows up, ponchos off, he talks to you, and he runs away. Done. You don't have to deal with 18 people doing jazz hands and under a street light. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather my idea? Ponchos off. It's a one man flash mob. He runs up, he bothers you forever long, he's going to bother you, and then he sprints into the distance. It's gorgeous. Instead of sitting around while 14 people pull out fake ponies and ride around you in a circle and then throw imaginary lassos around you and tie you up. All right. <laughs> so I uh, so Bert tries to get me to go to the tap at the Comedy Comedy in Oswego. And uh, I don't I don't want to do a bar. I mean, the, the whole point of booking these theater spaces is so I have some control over who shows up. And that's stupid. All right. Because even, even Max told me, he's like, you know, eventually you're going to do this for real people. Right. You know, you have to come out of your cocoon or uh, you know and and he's right and then there's part of me that's like why 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 do i have to play why can't i just preach to the choir the rest of my career well because my choir is really small and uh and i want to appeal to other people so i can get you know it, it all it, i need to appeal to a larger audience for money and whatever other reason um but it's good to know that i have a core group of people who do support and will support but at the same time i kind of have to reach outside of that and david's right he's absolutely right so but i but i you know what? Maybe the core that I'm trying to reach doesn't go to a bar in Oswego. You know what I mean? It's like I'm, and there's nothing against people. It's just I didn't want to deal with hecklers in the middle of the narrative of the show. And uh, but this time would not have been a bad time to do it. I probably could have pulled this off at the tap in Oswego because uh, the show has changed because I'm trying to change it for the CD and trying to pare it down. And it, maybe it would have been a good challenge, but I, I fuck, I wasn't up for a challenge. You know, it's <laughs> it's challenge enough for me to sell tickets and then go do a fucking show. <laughs> let alone worrying about the narrative and having to fight with people over it. So, but you know, David's not wrong. So I, I, but I fought it. I was like, I told Bert, look, I don't, I don't really want to come to Oswego and do the tap. I mean, it's a bar and it's not what I'm into. And so then he said, well, you know what? I have a room in Bolingbrook. That's really nice. It's like a, uh, it's on a, it's on a golf course and it's a private club and you know, you can do it that way. And I, I just, uh, Man, I was not interested in that. I, I don't want to go up in Bolingbrook where I grew up. Again, like I said, it's it's. It, uh, this will sound terrible. I'm not successful. 
So why go back there? There's no reason to go back if you're not successful. Uh, Because then you're just literally, it looks like what it is. I had to beg people to come watch me on a golf course. That's, that's the level I'm at. And granted it's, it's different than that. I mean, I have this show and other things, but, uh, but still that doesn't matter to whomever would show up and go, Oh geez, what a drag for him. He's playing at a golf course in fucking Bolingbroke. I mean, it just, I wanted to avoid that whole patina of sadness. And even though it really wouldn't have been, I would have fucking crushed it and been funny. But at the same time afterwards, it would have turned into a thing. And then, and also I would have been playing to a field, uh, a field, a sea of grandpas, because uh, I don't know if I told you this, everybody my age who stayed there looks at, is so much more older than I do because I look so great. <laughs> <coughs> By the way, Sea of Grandpas, much better band name than Yuva La Goiter. Mm-hmm. Although I don't know. Yeah, it would fit on a bass drum. Um, so Bert tried to get me to go to Bolingbroke, and I didn't want to do that. I was really pushing for the show at the Comedy Shrine, and I should have known. I should have fucking known by talking to him. He didn't want to book me there. But I was, I'm such a fucking child. I was obstinate in my head. I'm just like, why wouldn't you just book me? Dude, I see the guys you book every week. You know, I'm as good as they are. Book me, bring me in there. And maybe Bert's a little gun shy because the last time I played his club is the time I walked out on tables to fight guys in the back of the room. So I understand (laughs) if he doesn't want anything to do with me, but Bert's not the kind of guy to hold that against me. So as we talk over the course of a couple of weeks, it comes out and I find out really why um, Bert is kind of on shaky ground with the guys who own the fucking comedy shrine. And he tells me, you know, they have certain business differences and there are things that have been coming up and he's been fighting with them and arguing and he wasn't sure how much longer he would be at the the Comedy Shrine booking shows. So that was kind of why he was trying to deter me from working there. And uh, I heard all of those signals and then I heard him blatantly tell me, yeah, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be there. And guess what I did, folks? I continued to push for a show at the Comedy Shrine because it fit my needs. It suited my purpose. It was a theater space. And it had, you know, tables and chairs. It wasn't in the basement of a bar. And it wasn't in a golf course in front of people I grew up with. It was just, it was a place I wanted to be. It was, it was close enough to where I grew up, but it was also a club that had shows every week. So it wasn't like an off-brand event where people were like, what is this now? Something strange. No, it was fucking comedy and they had it all the time. So I kind of told Bert, you know, I really want to come out there. I would like to do that. And he kind of, he was like, all right, well, let me take a look. And I kept insisting, would you like me to talk to them? Would you like me to send an email to them? I'm happy to do it. And he's like, well, how much is it going to be? And I, I, I said, well, how much would they charge me to rent the room? And he's like, I don't know. I said, well, I can pay this much and just, I, I'll pay it up front, whatever they need. I go, it's the way I do it whenever I go out. And then I take all the money from the tickets. And he said, well, I'll talk to them and see if that's going to work. And, and I'm like, fine, you know. And in the meantime, I started making plans to come home because I didn't think there was no way it would that it wouldn't work. So a couple more days go by and I don't hear from him. And he, and he said, I'm going to call you in like 15 minutes. And he didn't call me. So I let two days go by and I called him back. I'm like, what is, what is happening? I go, is it a, and basically what it turns out is that he didn't want to talk to them because he's having problems with them. So he doesn't want to talk to them and just tell me that then I will fucking bother them. And if I can't work through them, I'll go somewhere else. And maybe I'll even go to Oswego in the bar. No, I wouldn't. Um, so then he, he contacts me and he's like, all right, look, he goes, I straightened it out. That amount you said is fine. I go, well, do you want me to send them a check? And he goes, you know what I would do if I was you, I would hold on to that check and pay them the night of the show. I said, okay. I go, if that's, if that's the way they want to do it. And he goes, I think that's best. I said, great. Tell them I will handle all the booking. I will take care of everything. I go, can I put anything on their website or your website? He goes, well, send me some stuff. But honestly, I don't really do anything on their website. It's all Facebook. I said, well, can I put something on the comedy, comedy shrine wall? And he goes, yeah, go ahead. And by the way, if you don't think it's a pain in the ass to say comedy, comedy at the comedy shrine every fucking time, it is. It completely is. <laughs> You, you can already hear, I've, I've abbreviated it a million times. Like, comedy at the shrine, comedy, comedy at the shrine, comedy, comedy. Com- I, I, I fuck, it's terrible. Comedy, comedy is a terrible name. It's a terrible name. Uh, but I'm not going to tell Bert that because he's put it in nine different locations. Um, and I know people out there right now are screaming. They're like, why would you do anything without a contract? Why would you do anything without those things? Well, honestly, most of the time I've done shows without a contract. It's been verbal over the phone. Uh, but I've at least spoken to the people. Some people actually will send me a contract and then I have to sign it and send it back. And and, it, and that works. If they want to work that way, I'm happy to sign contracts and get it squared away. Because other theaters I've had to actually pass on. There, there, were, there was a theater in Atlanta that I thought I was going to work at. And they wanted, you know, we had agreed on an amount that I was going to pay for rental. And then they sent me the contract and they wanted $1,500 retainer for insurance to make sure I didn't break anything. 
I said, it's just me talking. Yeah, I'm not fucking Gallagher. I'm not smashing shit. And they were like, well, I'm sorry. We kind of need that. You, you need to give us a deposit of 1500 It's, it's completely affordable and, and refundable. And I, I don't fucking think it's affordable. And I don't give a fuck if it's refundable. <laughs> Done. I made like more phone calls and got a different theater. Because again, I tell them, I go, it's just me talking. Um, eventually, I'm going to have to book a show where I'm driving a go-kart and smashing into shit just to justify these fucking things, I guess. <laughs> How great is that show? If I drive out in a go kart, you ever see when Gallagher comes out with the lay door? He had like the instead of the lay car, he had the lay door on like a tricycle. Yeah. I got to do that. I got to just drive out in a fucking three wheeler. But if I do that, I can't use it just for one gag. I'm gonna drive around in circles on that thing the whole time I'm doing the show. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I just get a fucking like a three wheel vehicle and just drive in a figure eight, <laughs> just talking with a fucking head a headset mic, a wireless mic, a lavalier mic, some sort of mic. So Bert and I square it away. We settle on the date, and then I announce it to you fine folks. Throw the tickets on sale. Uh, I put something on the Facebook wall for comedy, 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 and uh, I heard nothing from anybody. There was no response. Because you never know. You don't know who's paying attention to what. And here's the thing. There are people who still know me on Bert's mailing list from when I used to work at the Funny Bone. Because there were regulars who would come to the Funny Bone every weekend. And actually, it made me a better comic. Because I knew they were there. I had to change my material every week. So it made me write, which I wanted to do anyway, but you can get lazy if you're doing fucking five shows a weekend and you, you can wind up sitting there and, and especially if you're only doing 10 or 15 minutes up top. So you can just get through it and get the show going and go in the back and have some fucking nachos. Well, because I knew the same people were coming and they were very nice and they would introduce themselves to me and I got to be actually friendly with them. I needed to change my act because then they would come up to me and go, oh, you changed it. Great. And I, I think if we know anything about me. It's that I enjoy recognition. So just the fact that they would recognize that I made the effort to change my act and that it was still funny made me happy. So I was like, hey, can I get on your mailing list? Like, can you send out a blast that tells people that I'm going to be there? And uh, he's like, yeah, I, I can do that. Send me your information. So I sent him all the stuff. And I said, put my name on your mailing list so I know when it goes out. Well, I'm still waiting on that. I never even <laughs> got a response from him. I don't know if he sent it out or he put me on the mailing list or he forgot or he didn't care. I don't fucking know. I have no idea. So time passes and I, uh, I check in with Bert occasionally and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm selling some tickets. I just want to make sure that this is not going to get pulled out from under me. I mean, you're, you're guaranteeing me. You've talked to them. They know that I'm coming. I said, because I have not heard from anybody because he gave them all my contact information. I said, they haven't called me. They haven't said anything. I go, if you just tell me who I'm supposed to call over there, I will call them and bother them. And he's like, nah, you know, it's, they have all your info, everything's squared away. You just got to pay them. And da -da. I said, okay, fine. That's fine. So I start selling tickets. I start selling tickets. And about two weeks before the actual show, I start calling Bert and I go, I touch base with him. And uh, I apologize. He calls me first. And so I call him back and uh, he says, Hey, Hey, how's it going? I said, good. I go, are you, you all set up for that Friday? And am I on the mailing list? Yeah, I'll send it out. And I, I just want to tell you something. Um, I'm no longer affiliated with comedy comedy. I said, What? He goes, yeah, I, uh, well, I'm, I, with, the, with the shrine anyway. He goes, I still do my show in Oswego and I do the show in Baltimore. He goes, but uh, yeah, things got a little rough over there. And so uh, so this this coming weekend is my final weekend of shows. And he had told me when I had booked February 1st, he said, look, I won't be there that night. So because he had another gig out in Starved Rock, which is another place in, in, he books. And he's like, so I, I can't be your buffer with these guys. But, you know, just know that they know that you're coming. But just knowing that he was still booking, it was fine with me. But then when he pulls out completely, he's not booking it. And now he's not affiliated with them. So now I'm going in blind and I go, all right, well, what happened? And he's like, well, and you know, I don't want to expose whatever, but he had a falling out with them over certain things and, and he just bailed. So I said, okay, does this affect my show at all? He goes, no, no, they still know that you're coming. I checked. It was the last thing I checked with them and they said it was fine. I said, okay, are they going to call me ever to touch base? Are they going to anything like that? He's like, well, yeah, they should. I gave them all your information. I go, why don't you just give me their phone numbers and their names? I'll be, I'll call them. And he's like, well, he starts giving me the names, but he doesn't give me a phone number. He's like, they're never in the club and you got to leave a message. And then he goes, they'll call you. They assured me they would call you. I said, fine. Uh, in the meantime, I have to plan my travel out there. So I sat down to, to figure out when I was going to be there. And what I'll usually do is, you know, I, I'm, I fly American. I'm American gold. So it's like I don't have to pay for bags and all that kind of stuff, which is great. But occasionally American tickets will be out the fucking window. And you can find something that because 
it saves me fifty dollars to fly American because I don't have to pay for bags. But sometimes you'll find an airfare that is a full hundred bucks less than American, so it kind of makes sense because I have miles at Delta and United as well. So and Virgin. Um, so you just it's become the a, a, you kind of you guys know you've shopped for airfare. You just scope around looking for the best price. But I prefer American when I can. So I went on to look for a flight to Chicago, and I'll go to Orbitz. And Orbitz works because it shows you how much everybody wants. And then you go to the individual airline's website. Never buy through Orbitz. Fuck Orbitz. But it's good to show you what the prices are. And then you can go to those sites and find out. Um, so I go to Orbitz and I look for, you know, and it's a game. I, I've flown so many times now it becomes a game. I fly out of LAX and I fly to the, the airport that I want. And then you try LAX or you try Burbank. And then you try LAX and then all airports within 80 miles. And that's how I found prices in Ontario, prices in Orange County. They're all different. So I start fucking around with it. And then I do uh, airports within 80 miles of Chicago. Uh, and not that it's ever going to happen, but I said, why not? Just throw it in there. Because, again, you're just looking at all the prices you can. So the prices I was finding in Chicago when I was looking were like $315. Bucks. Um, American was a little more, like $340. But it would have saved money to fly back for $340. Uh, and I, I also get burned at this. Like I, I'm flying to San Francisco and I bought a ticket. Like right when I booked the show, I'll start looking. So I got a flight to San Francisco for, I think it was $200 on American. Uh, two weeks later I went and I could get a ticket on there for 114 bucks. Wow. Furious. Uh, but I made up for it with Chicago because when I was looking, like I said, it was about 315 was the lowest. It was Delta, I think, or United nonstop to Chicago, but American was 340. But when I did the 80 miles from Chicago search, a price came up. And now, folks, I, I don't know how this happened. Like, part of me thinks that some hacker did this. And I happened to catch the perfect window because the next day, this price was not there. But a pri I got a price from Los Angeles to Milwaukee. Milwaukee is about 90 miles from Chicago. From L.A. to Milwaukee... I got a round trip air ticket for $133. What? I, I mean, I have no idea how or why, but I will tell you this. Um, I bought it without thinking twice. Like I just, I said, yeah, get it. And it was, it, you know, it wasn't nonstop. It was one stop both ways there. Well, you know, the way there and the way home. And uh, I, so I, I go, well, fuck it. Just do it. Just do it. 133 bucks. You're never going to beat that. And I bought it thinking, you know what? It's no problem. I'll get from Milwaukee to Chicago easy. It's only 90 miles. Someone will pick me up or someone will drive me or I'll rent a car. It'll be because even if I rented a car and drove for the day, you know, with a tank of gas, whatever, that would be another 60 bucks. Uh, even if I even if I did it both ways, it's 120 added to the buck 30. I'm, I'm fine. Plus, I started to think of all these things I could do in Milwaukee anyway when I'm there because I, I wanted to find another theater because the first theater I played at in Milwaukee was okay, but it was in Mexico, as I think I've told you. Um, and I, I liked the space, but I thought maybe if I'm there, I can get a look around at another theater. And uh, and then um, Mike from Green Bay had talked to me about when I started to do a different show, he wanted to bring me to Green Bay and have me do the show up there. Uh, all sorts of stuff. So I was excited about that. And I, um, I, I should tell you, it's because I had to buy, the, to get the 133 bucks, I had to fly on Wednesday, even though my show was Friday, uh, and fly to Milwaukee. And I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe I can stay the night in Milwaukee and meet with theater people or go look around, do whatever I got to do. So I bought the ticket. I didn't fucking think about it. So I buy that airfare. I got that hip pocketed and I'm ready to go and I'm excited. And uh, I'm, then I wind up at all these negotiations with Bert to figure out what's going on. And then Bert informs me that he has left. So I want to call those people. I'm going to get a hold of them. And he's like, all right, I'll get you the information. And uh, I, so I, I'm, I'm sweating that, but I'm not really sweating it because, I, you know, I've sold tickets. And if we show up there and the guy's like, well, you don't have a show here, then I'm, I'll take everybody out somewhere. I don't, I don't fucking know. We'll figure something out. Because that, I will tell you, that is the, the, the benefit of performing to the choir or preaching to the choir and only to my fans. I think that if we all showed up in a venue and the venue fucked me, they'd all go, well, let's go somewhere else. And we'd hang out all night and just do that. I'd have to give everybody their 20 bucks back, but still it, would, it could be fine. And people wouldn't murder me over it because they'd realize it wasn't my fault. Um, although I guess maybe technically booking a show and never speaking to the guys who run the venue and then selling tickets for it would actually make it my fault in a certain way. <laughs> now that I think about it, um, so I, I'm like, all right, that's cool. I'll, I'll get this squared away. I go to fly. And then last week, like I said, I had to do the show on, did I do it on Sunday? Is that when I did it last week? I don't know. I had to do the show on a, a, early. 
because I was flying out of town. I, and actually, it was I, should, I apologize. It was a Tuesday red eye. So I was leaving on a, that's why we couldn't record on Tuesday. It was a Tuesday red eye. And then I was going to be gone Wednesday in Milwaukee. And then I had to be back in Chicago Thursday because I was doing my friend's radio show. My friend Brian Noonan at WGN Sports Night reached out and was like, dude, because I was just going to come back to Max's house on Thursday. But he goes, hey, would you want to do the radio show? So I figured it out where I'm like, all right. I can kill time in Milwaukee on Thursday until I get to get back. And then, uh, you know, some friendly listener will take me back to Chicago. It'll be fantastic. Or I can rent a car, whatever. Uh, it's going to be great. I'm going to put the word out and find out. So I get to town on Wednesday and uh, I'm going to go look at theaters. I, well, I should, all, right, well, let's, all right, let's start over. I fly out on the red eye on Tuesday night. All right. I get to the airport. Karen brings me um, United and there's a, a full stop. I got to go with one stop. I go to get on the plane. And uh, there's nobody sitting next to me when I check in. I checked in online at home. There was nobody sitting next to me. But then when I get there, I go to the little kiosk. Still nobody next to me. Awesome. Sitting at the airport, waiting. Board the plane. And uh, one thing that I was really worried about this trip was I, I've been, uh, I've basically sealed myself in bubble wrap for the entire month of December and January. The months of December and January. Because I, I did not want to get sick. Because there's nothing worse than being on the road of being sick. That happened to me once when I was on the road in a driving trip where I'm in the car and, you know, when I was doing stand up, uh, I was very far away from home. I was in South Dakota and it was a run where you had to do Sioux City, Iowa, and then I had to go to South Dakota. I had to go to Rapid City and work there. And uh, the tour closed in Deadwood. Well, I was in Rapid City and I got so sick, I, I could not talk. Like I almost, I had laryngitis and my voice faded. So I had to just spend the time in my hotel room drinking Theraflu and trying to stay hydrated so I didn't lose my voice. And then I had to go into a show at night and I sounded fucking awful. And, uh, I, you know, I would have bombed anyway. Let's be honest with ourselves. But the very <laughs> fact that I didn't have a very good speaking voice did not help. But I was able to power through it. So I just know that there's nothing worse than being on the road and being sick. So I was trying to make sure I did not get ill for this trip. It was, it was priority number one. Um, so I get on the plane. I board the plane. And I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm on the, I take six steps onto the airplane and a guy just out of, like in the exit row, just starts fucking hacking this vicious, vicious hacking from the depths of his chest, just as if he was going to call, I, I, I think he was a minor. I mean, I, I couldn't figure it out. He had a helmet with a light on it and the guy's got black lung. I, and I mean, I've stayed illness free. In the face of adversity, folks, I said in this particular room right here that I'm describing to you right now, the one that I'm sitting in talking, I've recorded shows in this room directly across from a five foot ten flu germ in a blue robe <laughs> and still made it out safe on the other side because I'm fucking indestructible. But now, now I'm climbing onto this fucking metal colon and I'm going to be trapped in there with Captain Trips the entire fucking time and I'm going to die. <laughs> Because that's all the plane is, is it's a metal colon. You load it up, and then four hours later, you got to shit everybody out of it. Oh, my God. So this guy's coughing like John Wayne in a fucking Brazilian nightclub, and I'm just like, <laughs> get me away from this guy. I'm walking just to get to my seat, and I'm going to cover my face with my hoodie. I, I, just, I just want to stay safe. So I get there, and I sit down, and he's still coughing. And people are looking around nervously, and I, like, is, does he have a problem? Like, do we have to give him the Heimlich? Is he choking? Um... But you can see everybody roll their eyes and groan because they're all like, we're going to get sick because of this guy on the plane. We know it. Uh, so I sit down in my chair. And again, like I said, nobody next to me. And uh, they start to announce the thing. They're closing the luggage, but the door's not closed. And I, I'm like the only guy, because they told me it was a full flight. I'm the only guy left and there's a seat next to me. There's nothing. And I'm like, I'm please close the doors, close the doors. They were booking standby people. They were putting all those people on the plane. And... Uh, and all of a sudden, like five crew people get on. I should say there were empty seats, but five crew people get on and take those seats, all middle seats. And they're pilots and fucking airline people in their Delta or their United clothes. And I'm just furious. They didn't sit by me. But once they start coming in and taking the other empty seats, it, it really lowers your odds. So if, if just one guy happens by and goes, hey, I'd love to go to Milwaukee via Cleveland, then he's going to get on the plane and I'm going to be fucked. And sure enough, last guy on the plane last fucking guy i don't and i that has to be a thing because it happens to me a lot that the last person on the plane sits next to me it has to be just a taunt from above or whoever runs the airlines is just fucking or, or maybe there's maybe they're doing it outside on purpose like the airlines 
want to fill the plane and make sure, and then they have their own employees out there just doing like a fat guy, rock, paper, fat guy. That's all. It's like <laughs> like a fat guy, Rochambeau. They're out there. It's like rock, rock, paper, scissors. And no, no, no scissors. Rock, paper, fat guy. And, uh, you know, oh, rock, paper. Ah, fat guy. Fat guy eats paper. Sorry, you lose. <laughs> rock, paper, fat guy. Ah, fat guy eats rock. Sorry. <laughs> So then you got to fucking get it. And this guy, this guy gets in the plane and he, he's the only guy, he's the last guy, but he gets on the plane and he sprints to where I'm sitting. He just, he runs like as, as best as you can run in that little fucking habit trail on the plane. He just fucking at a, at a decent clip. He's like, and he's, and like maniacally, like his face is all wild. Like he was running all the way across the airport to catch this flight anyway. But now he decided to run completely out of the plane. And he's just like John Candy from Stripes, just like running ah, maniacal. And he gets to my row and he's like, I'm in there. Like, oh, fucking course you are. So he gets in and he sits down next to me. And uh, he looked like John C. McGinley. Do you know who that is? He's an actor from Platoon, Wall Street. Uh, he was in Scrubs. He was the doctor who was a dick to fucking Zach Braff all the time. Uh, just that kind of guy. Like a weird face. Like a, He almost looks like a... You know, he looks like Beaker from The Muppets if he was a guy. <laughs> so he comes in and he sits next to me. And uh, he sits down, and I'm I'm there on the by the window, and I'm furious because now I've got to fly to Cleveland for four hours and forty minutes with a guy next to me, and then that's not even my final flight of the fucking day. Uh, I thought I was gonna be able to sprawl it, and it's a red eye. I was gonna go to sleep, but now this fucking guy's it just it just wedged in with me. And uh, when I say wedge, it's my fault. I mean, I got to lose some weight, folks, because I mean, I it's it's bad. I'm at that point again where I, I was embarrassed to fly and and hated the commute, like where because I was like feeling awful about myself so it's like that's got to change um so he flops down and he's like Whew. and uh the guy on the aisle sits down and we're all just sitting there the guy didn't even waste a moment it was like a moment of silence and then he takes his hands and he claps them on his knees so where are you guys heading <laughs> and um, i'm just like oh really you want to talk to me and so the other guy mentions that he's from uh, wherever he's going he's from cleveland and the other guy's oh I, i'm from cleveland and i I said to him, I go, were you a standby flyer? He goes, no, this is my flight. I'm supposed to be on here. It's just I was able to transfer. It's an earlier one. And I'm like, okay. I go, because you came running down the aisle like John Candy in Stripes. Like, I actually said that to him. I told him. And uh, he kind of didn't get the reference. Like, he made a face. And I'm like, never mind. I, that's fine. So he starts talking about Cleveland and L.A. And, uh, and then he goes, yeah, you know, I live in L.A. now, but I'm excited to go back to Cleveland. I'm going to see some friends and family. You know, I'm a lapsed Cleveland. My friends call me a lapsed Clevelander. And I wanted to go, should have called you the dork. But he didn't get the John Candy reference from Stripe, so I was pretty sure he wouldn't know what that reference was either. <laughs> so I let him just talk, and he's and my, and my favorite part is if you would have seen me. All right, look, there's a speaking of John Candy, there's a great sketch on SCTV where John Candy and Eugene Levy kidnapped Jackie Rogers Jr., who is Martin Short. And they kidnap him and they take him to a hotel room. And uh, Eugene Levy's the dumb one and John Candy's the smart one. So they're talking and uh, they're talking in front of Jackie Rogers Jr. And Eugene Levy is being an ass and John Candy says something mean to him. And Eugene Levy goes, well, Marcel, I was just thinking. And John Candy goes, and, and John Candy keeps him in line by like being Mo, like he hits him all the time. And he pushes him and he shoves him. Well, this time he goes, come on, Marcel, I was just thinking. And John Candy goes, oh, oh, oh so stupid. He goes, you. You call me Marcel. And Eugene Levy goes, yes. And he goes, in front of him who does not know my name is Marcel. And he goes, yes. And he goes, oh, oh, oh stupid. So, so stupid. And he's putting on gloves the entire time. Stupid. Oh, so stupid. And he looks at Eugene Levy and Eugene Levy looks at Jackie Rogers Jr. and goes, Mr. Rogers, this will take but a moment. And then John Candy slaps him 80 times in fast motion. Like, 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 from the th like he slaps him in the both cheeks and then under his chin and then on top of his head. And it's like, <laughs> but the setup of it is so gorgeous because he goes, because they're just kidnapped him and they don't want him to know his name. So he goes, Marcel. And he goes, you, you call me Marcel. And he's putting the gloves on. It's such a perfect setup. So this guy is talking and he's talking and talking. He keeps looking at me and talking. I'm not paying any attention to him. I'm just, I'm putting my gloves on. Essentially. I'm just unfolding my earbuds. I'm trying to untangle them so I can put them in my head and leave this fucking guy behind. So I do. I fucking, I unfold them. I put them in my shirt for my gimmick and I plug it in and I just put my hood up and I go to sleep. Out. He's still talking when I turn the iPod on, by the way. He's talking to the guy next to him because he's paying attention. So lights are out, red eye flight. 
And uh, I should tell you, on United, they have direct TV screens on the back of every t- f- seat. And it won't, like, it's shining in my face, even though I won't pay for direct TV. They wanted eight bucks for the flight, which is crazy because I, look, I have direct TV at my house. You want me to pay eight bucks for four hours of direct TV? I pay whatever I pay for a month. Ridiculous. I'm not going to do math for you folks, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, plus, it's a red eye. I'm going to pay eight bucks to see the fucking infomercials? No, I think not. Damn it. I'd rather sleep. But I can't turn the screen off. And it's flashing light in my face. So we're flying and I'm trying to sleep, but I can sleep fucking anywhere. All right. But I will say this. It's early for me. It's only like 11 o'clock at night. So I'm not tired, but I can force myself to sleep by being in the seat. So I'm there. I'm cramped up. I got my earbuds on and, uh, I, you know, I can still see the screen flashing through there. And also it's a red eye flight. So all the lights in the plane are off except for the guy next to me. They have their overhead lights on for some reason. I don't know if they're having a fucking campfire chat. I don't know. I, my earbuds are on and I don't fucking care. All I know is it's lit up. But I can sleep anywhere and I'm fine. I can deal with it. So I keep waking up and kind of like looking at the direct TV screen. But then I go out for about two hours. Then I wake up and both of their lights are on. My direct TV screens finally get sick. And I reach down by my handset. And there's a bunch of buttons. And I push one button twice and the direct TV screen goes off. Why did I fucking think of that two hours before? I don't know. I'm stupid. So I turn mine off. But theirs are still on blinking. And then they got their lights on. So I steal a glance over. And the guy on the aisle has a laptop and he's got it out and he's working. He's got headphones in and the John Candy guy, the John C. McGinley guy is sitting next to me. He's not talking to anybody and I don't want him to make eye contact with me because then he's going to fucking talk. But folks, he's got his light on. He's sitting in the seat alone with his mouth open. He's a mouth breather. And he's not reading anything and he has no earbuds in. He's just staring straight ahead, trapped with his own thoughts (laughs) on a four and a half hour flight. How do you not bring anything to read or something to look at? Or what kind of a fucking maniac are you that you can get lost with yourself for four and a half fucking hours? I wear an iPod because I love music, but also because it lets me shut my fucking head off for a certain amount of time so I can finally get some sleep. Because I've told you folks, I got a head full of bees. And that's not even like an exaggeration. Well, it is an exaggeration. I don't really have bees in my head. But I mean, my head is constantly buzzing with thoughts and ideas. I'll lay down to go to sleep. And for a half an hour, I'm thinking of snippets and things that I should remember to do on this show. And then, of course, I forget them fucking immediately when I wake up in the morning but it's all I can do to sit there and concentrate enough to get to sleep and turn my fucking head off. I couldn't imagine sitting there for four and a half hours not talking to anybody, not reading anything, not having any earbuds on and trying to live with just myself for four and a half hours. Holy shit, I don't like living with me for four and a half minutes. (laughs) I need constant stimulus. I need a soundtrack to my life. I don't want anything to do with sitting there by myself alone in silence. Fuck that. Because then you got to sit there and take stock of everything and that's not going to be good for me at all. I would like to ignore all the mistakes I've made and wound up in this situation. I would like to go ahead and try to put that on a fucking shelf and not have to make myself self-examine because that's going to be a problem for me and anybody around me as they drown in tears. But this guy is sitting next to me and he's just, and I mean, I don't know who, what kind of a fucking psychopath can do that? I can't, I can't for an hour. It's tough for five minutes. It's tough, but this guy, all I could think was he was taking stock of everyone on the plane and how he was going to kill them and he was going to kill them alphabetically. That's the only thing I could think of. You know, like A gets an all, B gets a bat. Like he's just going to fucking, every row gets killed with a different fucking weapon. That's the only thing I could think. I, I just, I didn't want to make eye contact because I know he'd talk to me. So I just like, I closed my eyes really quick, but it still freaked me out to the point with the lights in him. I could not get back to sleep. Because again, like I said, I'm not used to sleeping at that time, but I tried. I just laid there with my eyes closed and listened to music, which was fine. just better than talking to this guy, but he went the whole flight. I would have ordered, I would have fucking called the cart over. And then the other dude had a drink. This guy had no drink. It's like, dude, get a fucking juice box and read the ingredients. Anything to keep your mind off who you are as a person. Get yourself peanuts or buy something just to look at it. Read the in-flight magazine. Read the vomit bag. I don't care. Anything. At that point, pay the eight bucks. If it comes down to me being alone with me or paying eight bucks to watch somebody make pancakes in two different frying pans, done. I'm in. Paying for the money and watching the show. So I didn't want to talk to him, but I couldn't believe that he could sit there and fucking silence the entire trip. So we land in Cleveland and uh, I get out of the plane and I have like a two hour layover in Cleveland. I have to fly from there to Milwaukee, which is like an hour and a half flight. Layover goes fine. I get on the plane to Milwaukee. There's a guy next to me. And then 
there were empty seats and the second they closed the door, he got up and went and grabbed an empty seat. Thank God and left me alone. Um, I slept for that flight, got to Milwaukee and, uh, I should tell you this, I live in California and I've been bitching about how cold it is at night. I told you I had to flannel sheets on and I've been wearing Spider-Man pants around California. Yeah, that's because it was down to 45 degrees. You know what it was when I landed in Milwaukee? Four. Four. That's woefully short of 45. That's 41 degrees short of 45. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> I actually looked at my phone and it was 45 where I was and then a four there and I'm like, did there... Did they lose the five? Maybe they're missing a five somehow. And plus there was going to be a snowstorm in Milwaukee. So I was freaked out about that. Uh, but I get to the airport, get to my hotel, because I, I, I stayed in the hotel. And uh, I had forgotten to call Mike Yoder in Green Bay. And Green Bay's far from Milwaukee. It's like two hours. I don't know why. Like in my head, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll talk to Mike and I'll go there and I'll do that. I, I'm not mobile. I didn't rent a car because that would have been spending money. I didn't want to spend money. That was the whole point of saving, saving money on the airfare. So I'm in Milwaukee on Wednesday trying to find something to do, anything. And you know what I did? I did nothing on Wednesday. I was in my hotel room until like 3.30 and then I went to sleep. And then I woke up at like 8 o'clock that night and then I was in my hotel room. And I, I did my Facebook and stuff and I wrote the email and I got the, the episode got posted that night. And I didn't even go out to dinner. I didn't even go out of my room. I did nothing. I sat in my room in Milwaukee at the Radisson and stared. And it's also my fault because I didn't really put out the word that I was in Milwaukee to meet anybody. Uh, and I never really checked ahead to get a ride. Um, well, I'll tell you this. I, I was going to get a ride from Milwaukee to Chicago on Thursday. Uh, and it was also, you know, I had a listener who wanted to go ahead and do that. That was fine. And then I was talking to Max and I'm like, all right, dude, I'm going to get brought to the house probably around this time, but I got to do Brian's radio show. I'm trying to figure out a time. And he's like, well, how are you getting here? I said, well, a listener's bringing me. And he goes, what? I said, yeah, a listener's going to just drive me from, I said, it's cool because when I go places, people are really nice. They offer to do stuff. And he goes, you're having a listener come to my house. I said, well, yeah, they're just dropping me off. And he goes, yeah, yeah I don't think so. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't know these people. And he's right. I, I mean, it's like, I just, again, never thought, because I'm so used to seeing you guys and I'll go out and we'll hang out and we'll do stuff. But at the same time, it's not like we're really hanging out and doing stuff. We go have a sandwich and then you drop me off somewhere at my hotel. And there's usually most of you in numbers. So I don't have to be one-on-one -on -one with any of you and I'm not going to be murdered, which is fine. But you know, Max has kids, he's got a family and he's got, and he's not, this is not his deal. You know, he does the artwork and the music and he's, and that's all he wants to do. He doesn't want to do meet and greets and he doesn't want to meet people. Whereas I need love. And so I want to see everybody. <laughs> so Max is just like, dude, yeah, no, no, that's, uh, that's probably not going to work. I'm not going to, I'm not, I can't have somebody I don't know at my house. And I, and so that threw a, a pretty big wrench in my plans for getting back from Milwaukee to Chicago. So I knew I had to be back in town on Thursday to do the radio show with Brian. So I had to get to downtown Chicago to do the radio show at nine. And then I would be done there by nine 30, 10 o'clock. And then I had to get from Chicago to where Max lives, which is about 45 minutes. So if I didn't have a lister taking me, I, so then I was going to rent a car to go from Milwaukee. And then I'm like, well, then I got to park in downtown Chicago. I couldn't figure out what to do. So here was the decision that someone helped me make. They're like, you know what you could do? You could take the train. And, uh, I went, all right. I went to the website. I checked it out and it was, you know, 25 bucks for a ticket. And that was a one-way ticket from Milwaukee to Chicago. And then that would let me off there. And then, cause Max, then when I'm on the phone, he goes, he goes, Hey dude, I'll just pick you up in Chicago. And I'm like, seriously? He goes, yeah, it's no problem. I can come and get you after the radio show. And then part of me was like, well, then why didn't I have someone take me to Chicago and then he could have picked me up and then I, would, I don't have to pay the 25 bucks for the train. But at that point, I don't fucking care. I'm in. I bought the plane, the train ticket and let's go. So I buy a train ticket and uh, I haven't been on a train in a while, but I can tell you this. That was the last time they claimed him. <laughs> <laughs> I took Amtrak from Milwaukee to Chicago and uh, look, there's it's romantic. There's I can't lie. I really like the idea of riding on a train. I like seeing the world go by in not really slow motion, but just knowing that there are people out there who live in those places. And it's, it's a real throwback and I can really lose myself in the, in the travel part of it. Uh, what I can't lose myself in is the smell of the train and the filth 
And again, it's also because it's winter, man. It's like my bag was in the snow and it's got snow and salt and sleet and slush and anything else that begins with S is all over my bag. And uh, so I'm sitting there just trying to get my iPod on and I'm looking out the window and it's great because you hear the train whistle and that's kind of fun. But at the same time, I'm so in fear of bed bugs. And I know that the people traveling on the train are the poor and I don't want to travel with the poor. It's awful. Um, they are. People are awful. Poor people are terrible. Let's face it. I am one. I was one and I sort of am one now. I mean, I'm rich in experience in life and I'm certainly rich in humor. However, I can tell you that I am poor financially and I was poor as a kid. So I know what it's like to be poor. I'm still poor. What the fuck am I? Who am I kidding? But I'm not poor enough to be on the train and like it, but I sort of liked it. Ah, fuck. Who knows? I'm confusing myself. Bottom line is I don't want to travel like a poor person. So I get in the train and I'm traveling like a goddamn poor person with poor people. They, they come. They're part of the package. That's the worst part. If I could travel like a poor person alone, that would be fine because nobody else would know that I was poor. But then when I have to get on the a train with a poor flash mob, that's the original flash mob, poor people, because they got nothing to do except show up in one spot together and do something that doesn't cost money. Oh my God. Poor people are the original flash mob. So we formed this flash mob on the train and we're riding and, uh, and it was just, so then I started Facebooking it and just being funny about how fucking retarded it was to be on the goddamn train and how awful it was. And, uh, but it was okay. I, I suffered through and I got to union station, uh, earlier than I thought it actually, we flew on the train. It was crazy. And, uh, I get out, go to grab a cab, get to, uh, the radio station. I did my radio show with Brian Noonan and David Kaplan, Dave Kaplan, the cap man on Twitter. And I fucking crushed it. I'll tell you what. I sat in the green room and listened to their show. And then they brought me in. And uh, and I was so excited. Because I don't, I don't know Dave. You know what I mean? But I, I will tell you, Dave's Dave's got a bit of an alpha male streak in him. So in my head, I was like, because I, you know me, folks. I set up a fight wherever I go. Like, it just, not a fight, but an argument or a struggle for territory. I'm always proving myself. Whether people think I am or I'm not, whether people want me to or not, I'm constantly on a quest to prove that I'm, I'm better or good or I'm worth it. It's stupid. I shouldn't be that way, but I am. So I was going to do this radio show, and it's in Chicago on the blowtorch, and I'm excited. But at the same time, I know Brian. Brian and I have done radio together a million times, but I don't know Dave. And so I don't know how he's going to receive me. Because I will tell you this. People who are kind of alpha males or uh, who, you know, he's a radio host and he's been, he's been on TV, he's done all sorts of things, so they can get threatened if you come into their territory because they don't know who you are. And again, Brian knows me, so Brian brings me, and so that immediately sets up a weird us versus him dynamic. I need to make sure that he, seriously, I mean, just he might be thinking that. I don't know. I don't know what I'm stepping into. So I meet him outside. He comes out to the green room and he's like, are you Mike? Yeah, I'm Dave. I go, hey. He goes, you know what? He goes, uh, I was at the TV gig today and I mentioned to somebody that you were coming in and they said, you are fucking hilarious. And I went, oh, he goes, so I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be great. And then he walked off and everything went away. Every, everything that I was worried about, any sort of thought of me going in there and butting heads with him or having to rely on Brian to shepherd me through, he's a pro. The guy's a fucking pro. He's a radio guy. And it didn't hurt that someone he knows told him that I was funny. So I wasn't coming in cold. And I walked in. We sat down. And again, he's not familiar with me. And then you kind of, it's funny. Remember I mentioned on the flash mob, how you have to go, well, what's a flash mob? It's a bunch of people getting in a movie. You have to explain it. Well, on this radio appearance, my first segment was explaining what a podcast was. <laughs> because WGN is a notorious, notoriously older skewing radio station. So they want people to know who you are and that you have value and what you do is out there in the world somewhere. And they also want to plug the show, which was great. So Dave starts asking me about podcasts and he says he does a lot of long driving. I said, my show is for you. I said, do me a favor, download one of them and uh, you might hate it. <laughs> you might like it. If you like it, great. If you hate it, don't ever listen to it again. But if you want to kill time on drives, I'm your guy. <laughs> Cause he's like, yeah, I got to drive three hours to cover Eastern Michigan and I got to go here. And I go, yeah, definitely dude. I'm, I'm your, I'm in the car with you on the way to Ypsilanti. Let's do it. So then we started talking and we started telling stories and I was, in, I was supposed to be there. I thought a half an hour. I stayed for the whole final hour. I was there to like close the show. And, uh, again, let me, let me stress this folks. I was fucking amazing. I was amazing. Uh, they just threw it to me and I would run with stories and then they'd jump in and I would, you know, we played ping pong. We played three way ping pong and it was fantastic. We had a great time. And the whole time in my head, I'm thinking, why won't somebody hear this and offer me a job? Why won't somebody hear this and go, Oh, that's the guy you need. That guy who's funny all the time and facilitating. And I, as much as I love doing this show by myself, which I do, as you could probably tell, if you look at how much time has elapsed, but, uh, <laughs> I love talking with other people. I just got a note in the mail from a guy. 
by the way, I don't know if this is a guy. I get a note in the mail. I don't know if it's a guy or a girl. It's this weird name, and he's never he never signs his notes. He'll um I don't want to give away his email address, but his email address is a name. But it's a vague name. Like it could be a last name or something. And then he'll write me, or she will write me, or somebody will write me, and they will they will only use the first initial of that name as their signature. And they've never betrayed gender in their email. So, I mean, it could be a fucking yak writing me from the zoo. I mean, I have no idea who the fuck is writing me. But they wrote me and they heard me on the Road Stories podcast just recently. And the guy said, you are amazing with people. Like, to hear them, he goes, it's funny. And again, this is just, this is what his interpretation was. He said, the three of them will, like, set something up and then you will sh- you will start talking and mow it down. Like, you will just fucking completely destroy it. And then they will start setting something else up and then you'll fucking carpet bomb it. He goes, it's great. The dynamic. He goes, I love hearing you tell stories, but to hear you with other people where you just kind of jump in. And it's funny. I like, I, I haven't written him back, but I want to tell him if he's listening, uh, that was my role on never not funny. You know, never not funny. Jimmy was the host and then Matt was the producer. And then they used to call me the assassin that became a running joke because I would fucking just gun down anything that we were doing and just fucking scorched earth the whole thing. So that's fun to do. And it's and so when I got in there with those guys on GN, I just got to be funny. So I was kind of driving the show, but then they'd chime in and they'd make me laugh. And then we and I just I sat there going, wouldn't this be glorious? It would be fucking glorious to just do this. And I should tell you, it was fucking freezing when I got there. I got there early and I got out of the cab. It was so fucking cold. It was um it was one in Chicago, but then there was the the like the wind chill made it feel like it was 18 below. I mean it was it, I fucking hugged a hobo. That's how cold it was, folks. <laughs> you know my feelings on hobos and fuck them, but when I got to stay warm, I don't care. It's hobo hugging weather. Get close here, sticky. We are staying warm together. God, I walked out on the street and saw a dude. I, I just practically leaped into his arms like Scooby Doo into Shaggy's in the credits of the fucking cartoon because I was like, "Hold me, I'm freezing." You know, they say there's no atheists in foxholes. There's no hobo haters in below zero weather. We're all in it together. Come here and grab me. So I, uh, so I did the show and, and and crushed it. It was great. It went really well. And when I walked out, you know, people wrote me on Twitter and they were very nice. They listened because you could listen nationwide. And again, I just. I fantasized about having that job, like being the Artie Lang of somebody's show and just being able to go in and get fucking paid to be me. God damn, that'd be fantastic. Not that I don't love doing this and I would continue to do this, but at the same time, if somebody wants to pay me to do a radio show and just be the fucking assassin and make dough, I'm in. I'm fucking in. Uh, and pl- plus, literally, I was high on life and just killed it on a major metropolitan radio station, but I was an hour and a half removed from getting off of a train. What the fuck? <laughs> That's awful. The train is all the train is the worst. Literally, I like I said, it's romantic and you kind of get into it. But at the same time, the train is the worst form of transportation because you're embarrassed. You're embarrassed that you're on it. Like you're it's the weirdest feeling because you're simultaneously hoping at the same time that you'll crash and that you won't crash. Because if you crash, that means your horrible experience on the train is finally over. But if you do crash, that means you die in a train crash. And then everybody knows that you rode the fucking train. <laughs> That's actually your eulogy. They'll have your wake and the guy will just go up there and go, he rode the fucking train. <laughs> He's in a far better place. And by a better place, I don't mean heaven. I mean in the ground. <laughs> Believe me, that's even better than being on a fucking train. So I walk outside. Max is going to pick me up downtown. I see him. He's got his flashers on. And the funny thing was, I could see him. He's got his flash. He tells me where he is, but I don't know what directions. He's like, I'm north of there. I don't fucking know what that means. I'm just looking for your car. So I walk out and I see a car with flashers and it has to be him, right? So I wave. I'm waving at it. Nothing. So I go back in to talk to Brian in the lobby and he gets his stuff and we walk out and Brian goes, that's him. I go, well, I don't, he goes, yeah, that's North. Let's go. So we walk over and Brian drops me off at the car and Max takes me back to the place. So Friday rolls around and I talked to Bert on the phone and I'm like, Hey, uh, have you heard anything from these guys? I said, cause I haven't. And he says, no, he goes, but you're fine. Everything's all set up. I go, can you give me the number that I, that I can reach them at? He goes, Oh, we'll just call the theater. But why didn't you tell me to just fuck? Because I thought it was a hotline or something I had to call. And I guess I could have on my own just called the theater, but I was figuring everything was fine. So he tells me the names of the guy. There's Dave and Patrick. Dave is the owner. Patrick's the manager. That's who I need to talk to. So I said, all right, talk to Bert. He's got his show. See you later. So I call them. No answer. Not even an answering machine. This is a business. This is a theater that sells tickets to a show. So I'm at Dave's house getting ready for the show. Uh, I call them again, no answer. And now, I mean, it's like four o'clock in the afternoon, no answer. There's shows at their club that night. All right. 
So whenever I do these shows on the road, we always try to figure out a place to go afterwards. And it always turns into a cell phone circus where everybody's like, I don't know. Hey, what's, let's Google something. Well, this time I wanted to avoid that. So there was a pizza place that I used to work at when I lived in Chicago or in, in this area. Uh, and it was the place where I actually cut my hand on the meat slicer. I've told that story here. And they're open till midnight. So I call them. I go, what time you guys close? They said midnight. Great. So on my Facebook page, I put, look, this is where we're going after the show. Everybody have it in your GPS or ready on your phones. That's where we're going to go. It's going to be fine. I just didn't want it to turn into a circus. So some people like that. Some people, you know, they post whatever. And I call them a third time and I get no answer. Now I have to be there. My show's at eight. I figure I get there at seven. I should be okay. I called them at 515 and I got no answer. So I told Max, I go, hey, you know, I'd like to get there a little early if we can, because I don't even know if they exist. <laughs> he said, no problem. So his family has dinner and I don't eat the day of a show. So I'm getting ready, get showered and dressed about quarter to seven. He's like, all right, you ready? I said, yeah, we opened the uh, garage. He's got to warm the car up. We'd move and we had to make a couple of stops. We, uh, we go out to the car and we drive. We drive about five minutes and he had to stop at Walgreens because he had to hit an ATM and I need to propel to be on stage. So I walk into Walgreens, they did not sell Propel because nobody sells Propel. It's only like literally like Jewel or Dominic's or, you know, a grocery store sells it, but no other fucking convenience stores sell it. It's always a minor miracle when I stumble into it. So I go into Walgreens, there's nothing there. So I walk out, he's at the ATM and I go, hey, they got nothing here. I go, can we stop at Jewel, which is on the way? He said, yeah, sure. We walk outside and he looks at me, he goes, uh, you don't have a coat on. And it's, again, it's two degrees. I go, yeah, I forgot my coat at your house. He goes, do you want to go home and get it? It's five minutes. I go, no, I need Propel more than I need my coat. <laughs> He's like, all right, dude. I'll just, you know, leave your frozen body by the side of the fucking road. Uh, we stop. Jewel, I run in and get some Propel. We go to the theater. And we pull into the theater, and uh, it's in a strip mall. Okay, there's a bunch of, you know, closed businesses. And then you just see Comedy Shrine in big, nondescript red lettering. Neon lit up. As we get closer, there's like a sign outside a red... Sign, and I can't make out who's on it, but as we get closer, sure enough, hey, guess who's on the sign outside? Groucho Marx. And right next to him, there's a picture of W.C. Fields. And I'm like, um, are you hoping to draw people who were born in this century to your comedy club? And on the windows, they've got, uh, you know, Jack Benny and Bob Hope. And, and, you know, they had some like George Carlin and Bill Cosby. But but so fucking what? Well, who are you marketing to? What what 90 year olds do you think you think are going to wander in with their ear horns and try to strain to hear the fucking show? It just seems antithetical to advertise a comedy show with people who are not funny anymore at all. Groucho's sort of funny. But W.C. Fields, honestly, it was so funny. I guess his birthday was just like a year ago. Are you a fan? Okay, because I was just going to say it was his birthday like a week ago. And on Facebook, because uh, I have a lot of crossover with Lily, all these burlesque people. And they're like, W.C. Fields' birthday. Ha -ha, I'm going to go out and never give a sucker an even break. Woohoo, my little chickadees. And I'm like, get off Facebook. You are, you are aging this, this fucking technology <laughs> just by posting about this. Woohoo, Buster Keaton's a lie. He's out there not. Fuck off. God damn it. Enough. <laughs> Do me a favor. You look at my watch. You see Harold Lloyd hanging from an arm of it? No, you don't. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Old time comedy has never been funny in a million years. Never, ever been funny. Marx Brothers, funny. Three Stooges, funny. Everybody else, get bombed. I'm not wrong. W.C. Fields. Hey, I drink and I hate kids. Done. I've summed up his whole career. Oh, awful. There are people online, they're like, we got to work up a routine for W.C. Fields. Oh, okay, good. You do that. Do me a favor. Do it by windy phone because you shouldn't be using new technology <laughs> to put together old shit. Grab your phone, pick it up, and go, like, roll the crank and just go, Mabel, get me another W.C. Fields impersonator. All right. All right really? You're leaving? You're pissed? <laughs> All right. It's late now. I, I should tell you this, folks. We've been sitting around. It's very late. Lily wants me out of her house. Her knee hurts. Her hip hurts. It's terrible. Um, because I, I held her hostage. I got here late. It was my fault because I was wiped out. Well, I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> so... So, but that's who's on their windows. Look, that doesn't sell me. All right, let's put it that way. You love them, and that's fine. And maybe you wander into that place, but I, nobody's going to wander in there to see me. Nobody's going to drive by and go, "Hey, look, who's that?" WC Fields. Let's stop and see if it's funny. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, the only way I want to see WC Fields on your window is if you are the WC Fields Museum. That's it. <laughs> so Max and I park. I walk in. Or Max is parking, and I get out of the car, and he he because he dropped me off out front. 
I walk in and uh, it's huge. First of all, this place, it, it, I don't know what it used to be, but it's gigantic. So when I walk in, there's a box office on my immediate left and I look at this girl and I go, hi. And I'm carrying my duffel bag full of t-shirts and, and something, uh, my other bag, my computer bag. And a guy across the way at the bar turns around and goes, are you Mike? And I go, I am. And he goes, do you have a list or something of people like that we can, that we can check in? I said, yeah, I got it with me. And he's panicked. Like he's flustered and panicked and there's no hi, there's no hello right away. It's, are you Mike? Yeah. Do you have a list? I go, yeah. And I start to get, he goes, do you have a check for me? And I go, yes. He goes, okay. And he turns around and walks away. Doesn't introduce himself. Wow. Doesn't ask what I do or where I'm from or show any interest in me whatsoever. He walks away, goes back to the bar. <laughs> so I look in the box office and there's a girl sitting there eating a turkey sandwich. <laughs> and I said, hi, I'm Mike. She goes, hey, I'm Jocelyn. I go, Jocelyn with a C or an S? And she dumbfoundedly looks at me and goes, what? I go, with a C or an S? The standard Jocelyn or you go different? You got an S in there. She goes, no, C. I was like, oh, okay. And I hand her my list and I go, we got to talk about that. And another girl walks in and I go, I'm Mike. And she goes, I'm Angela. And she runs up and shakes my hand really nice. Uh, and I go, oh, okay, well, I'm doing the show and just here's a list. And so I run down the list because uh, when you guys buy tickets, some people are will call, some people have physical tickets, some people have mobile tickets that they can show with their phone. Uh, and everybody, if they want their tickets, so they can keep it or they can throw it away. So I have to go through all of that with the box office because I'm used to doing this in every theater I book. I show up, I meet them, I tell them what needs to be done with the tickets, everything's great. And then I tell them what I need, you know, with the tech, everything. Well, I'm talking to Jocelyn, who's eating her turkey sandwich and could not care less. Angela's paying attention and I go, okay, well, nice to meet. And Jocelyn wasn't mean. She's just an 18 year old girl who works in the ticket booth of a comedy club. She can not, no, she doesn't care. So I walk out and I've got my t-shirts. Max walks in and we walk through the comedy shrine. The comedy shrine is just that it has two performing spaces, but they are surrounded by memorabilia stacked to the ceiling, bobbleheads of Bill Hicks, uh, three stooges, costumes a Benny Hill life-size statue <laughs> I mean it is this treasure trove of comedy memorabilia that you would want to be collecting and have in a room on display it is there's a ton of it and it's impressive is it something I would want no but I totally got the comedy shrine vibe the second I started to look at everything Every wall, every inch of the walls is covered with comedy movie posters. Some of them signed, some of them not signed. Uh, there, there's like an actual outfit from a comedy, I'm trying to remember what movie it was, like uh, uh, not Caddyshack, but some other, like it was an actual outfit on the wall. So the guy, he's a collector, he's got a ton of stuff. So I walk in and I get deeper into the club, which you, you know, you have to walk in. It, it, this place must have been a supermarket or something because it's gigantic. So I walk in and uh, that dude is still at the bar and he doesn't talk to me and the bartender is there. And he's chopping garnishes. He's chopping oranges. So I reach out my hand and I go, hey, I'm Mike. And uh, he doesn't even look up at me. And he continues to chop oranges. He goes, I'm Bear. And he continues to chop oranges and ignores my handshake. Uh, all right. So then there's another girl there and she's by the popcorn machine. And I go, I'm Mike. And she goes, I'm Amy. I go, are you a, are you a bartender person? And she goes, no, I do the popcorn. I said, great. So I shake her hand. And then the other dude who greeted me when I walked in the door I look at him and he looks at me and he goes, I'm Patrick. I go, oh, you're the manager? He goes, yeah. I go, cool. He goes, all right, so you've got the list and that's all taken care of and you got a check for me? I said, can I take care of that after the show? And he goes, sure, that's no problem. And I go, good. I go, I'm, I'm going to have walk-up people and then afterwards you can give me my cash and when you do that, we'll straighten it out. I'll give you your check. And he goes, great, whatever you want to do. So uh, they leave me alone th to my own devices. Nobody asks me what I need, what I want to do, what the show is, where I'm from. They, they don't care. They don't care. I'll be honest with you. They are... I'm just going to, you know, this is my judgment just coming in, but, and I, uh, they don't care. They don't, they don't give a fuck. They own a space and I was a commodity. They don't love comedy. They don't, they're jaded. You know what they are? They're jaded from producing comedy. And that's the worst kind of club owner you want to meet because it's somebody who's just going through the motions. And that's what I felt about them. So I walked into my room, I walk in and it was, I will tell you this, it was a big room, nice space. And there was a piano on the side, like a, an electric piano. 
So I walk in and, and uh, I start setting up the stage. I grab a table and I put it up there because again, nobody's helping me. Nobody asks what I need or if I need anything. I set up a, a table on the stage. I put my propeller and my towel out. I start I was looking for a microphone stand and I said, dude, you got to play piano while I'm on stage to Mex. And I go, he goes, what? I go, come on, it'll be hysterical. And he goes, I'm not doing that. But then he sat down at the piano and started to plunk around, which was fun. So I'm setting my thing up and I go back looking in the green room. There's no green room. There's a ramp behind the stage with nowhere to sit or put anything. So I'm like, fuck, I'm going to have to leave my t-shirts out here. So he's plunking around on the piano. I'm setting the room up and uh, a guy comes in, older guy. He goes, hey, how do? And I go, how are you? And I forgot his name, but he introduced himself and he shakes my hand. I said, good to meet you. And he goes, uh, I go, who are you? And he goes, I'm the piano player for the improv room. I said, that's awesome. He goes, yeah, you guys are in the wrong place. I said, we are, aren't we? And he goes, yeah, that's the pianos here. It's the improv group. This is the improv room. You're in the other room. I said, oh, okay, cool. I go, I was wondering why there was no green room. And he goes, yeah, you know, they should have grabbed you and taken you in there, but that's fine. So I grab all my stuff. I put the table back into the crowd. I grab my, every, and I walk out of the room and I go, where's the other room? And they go, oh, it's over there. Nobody walks me over. Nobody says hi or sorry or anything. I walk to that room. I walk in and uh, it's the same exact room with no piano. So uh, I grab a table. I set it up on stage and a little guy comes in and he goes, hey, I'm Kevin. I go, hey, Kevin, I'm Mike. He goes, good to meet you. He goes, so uh, you need anything? I go, well, no, I got the table up here. That's fine. Uh, he goes, well, do you need a microphone? Yeah, I need a fucking microphone, Kevin. Uh, you know, wh what do you think? He goes, well, I didn't say it that mean, but I was like, yeah, I, of course I need a microphone, Kevin. I got to talk. And he's like, oh, okay, well, I'll get it and I'll set it up. And I go, why wouldn't, I, who, who doesn't need a microphone? And he goes, well, we did, I just don't know what you do. And he goes, I know you booked it, so I didn't know if it's, you don't need a microphone. If you And I go, I'm, I'm good. I need a microphone. So Kevin goes off to get a microphone. I go in the back. There's a green room. I put my stuff in there. And, uh, oh, I should tell you this one. Patrick, when he asked if I had a list, he goes, yeah, you've already got people here. I said, okay. So I look over and there was Derek Leitner, who's a fan of the show. And, uh, and he's seen the show before and he brought a young lady with him. I don't know if she wants me to say her name, so I won't, but I guess he's dating her now, which is good. And then, uh, David Kemp came from Indianapolis and they're all, you know, they're waiting for the show or to get seated. They haven't even seated them or shown them where, uh, uh, <laughs> so I go in, I set my stuff up. I go in the green room, I start reviewing stuff and I can hear people filing in and Kevin comes in and he goes, Hey, when are you done? I said, I'll be done around 10 o'clock. He goes, well, more like nine 30, right? Cause there's a, there's a 10 o'clock show. Now when I booked this with Bert, I told him normally it's three hours, but I'm trying to cut it. I said, but I'll definitely be off by 10 o'clock. I said, I don't know how long it's going to last, but I'll definitely be finished by 10. Cause he goes, well, there's a late show at 10 o'clock. I go, that's fine. I'll, I'll be done by then. So the guy says 930, right? Cause there's a 10 o'clock show. I said, well, yeah. I said, I, I hope so. I said, I, I don't know how long it's going to go, but I'll, I'm going to do my show, but I will definitely be off by 10 o'clock. He goes, all right, well, 930 would be better. I said, I understand that. So he goes, okay, good. So Kevin walks off. I'm in the back learning some jokes. Room starts filling up. And, uh, I didn't bring music. I didn't have any music cues. I didn't bring in-room music because they had an iPod and, and, and nobody talked to me again. Nobody said a fucking word to me. Nobody, they didn't come to me and say, Hey, do us a favor. There's a 10 o'clock show. So if you could be done by nine 30, that'd be great. They just, he just basically like nine 30, right? You'll be done. No, no, no. I, I'll be done when I'm done. I said, I'll definitely be done by 10. Now I should tell you that Max thinks I'm wrong here. Um, he thinks that if they said nine 30, I should tell them, yeah, okay, and work with them or whatever. I said, but nobody came to me. Nobody said anything to me. And they were fucking cunts when I walked in the goddamn door, which they probably weren't. This is the way they deal with everybody, but I'm not everybody. <laughs> and I paid to rent the fucking theater, and I sold fucking 50 tickets from people who came from different states to come to your place that you had never had in there. I Believe me, I was told the kind of crowds they get on a Friday night, and I beat them. So I'm in the green room waiting. Show starts. Kevin stops a song in the middle. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Schmidt. Because he, he goes, do you need an intro? And I was like, well, you know what? You can say from the 40-Year-Old Boy podcast. He goes, oh, well, let me get a pen. Never mind, Kevin. Just say, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Schmidt. I go, they know. They know who I am. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, Mike Schmidt, I go out and I perform. Um, and I'm on stage. And I will tell you, I was rusty. I hadn't been on since St. Louis. And it's weird. I, I hadn't run into this problem yet in doing shows. But I got on stage and the first 
segment, the, the beginning of the show, because I also, it's new for me because I don't know what I'm doing technically. I'm trying to chop it up and get it ready for the CD because with the CD, it can only be like 90 minutes. So I, I made some changes, but I didn't know how they were going to play. And I also talked about, you know, I, I talked about my travels and some of the stuff you've heard on here, which I can't do in the CD, whatever the fuck. So I get out there and I'm kind of finding my way and they were super quiet. I should tell you this, the crowd was really quiet. And that's not on them. That's on me because I wasn't funny enough to get them laughing. Well, I kind of feed off of people laughing. So when they weren't laughing, I, I wasn't, there was no r wave to surf. So I'm just sitting in stagnant water and floundering and trying to find a direction. And I felt like the, the first certainly half hour was not, was not great to the point where I had told Max, I go, well, look, I'm going to tell these people that I'm just kind of, I don't know where I'm going. And he goes, you don't do that. He goes, just do your show. He goes, why would you tell them that it's going to be bad or that you don't know what you're doing? Uh, which makes sense until you're not doing well. And so I reached out and I was like, look, there's a reason I'm fucking bombing and this is it. And I tried to explain it and I kind of became me a little bit. Um, and I felt better about it because I have to deal with what's going on in the moment. It's stupid. It's a crutch and it's something I have to get past. But it got me off the schneid there and I was able to talk and do some stuff. So the show started to go well. I got into the narrative of it and I was doing really good. And I looked at my watch uh, and I actually, I, I knew it was going to bump right up into 10 o'clock. So at like 920, I actually stopped talking and I said, you know what, folks, I, uh, I had a plan here and I think it's kind of going awry. I go, I'm gonna have to cut something I think on the fly, but maybe I won't, but I'll just, you know, what? I'll just try to make it work. And, and so then I kept talking and, uh, 930 rolls around and in comedy, they flash lights at you. You know, they give you the light when you've got five minutes left. <clears throat> well, I had already told Kevin I would be done at 10 o'clock and I had not talked to Patrick because Patrick had not come back into the room. And I should tell you, I met Dave, the actual owner. Dave was the nicest of all of them. Dave introduced himself to me uh, before the show. Oh, I should tell you this too. Before the show actually started, this is when I met Dave. I went out to the bar and I wanted a bottle of water and I was standing at the bar and Bear, the bartender, uh, saw me, ignored me. He was filling his ice bucket. So he was getting his bar ready for to open and he kept putting ice in and he walks over and gets ice out of the machine and then starts putting it back in by the sink. And he walks past me four times without even saying hello or acknowledging me standing there at the bar. Uh, finally, Dave, the owner goes around the bar and he introduces himself and I shake his hand and uh, he walks away. And then Patrick comes over and goes, Hey, can I get you something? I said, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of interested to see if Bear's going to stop and acknowledge me at some point. And he goes, <laughs> Oh, that's just Bear. What do you need? So in other words, that's just Bear. He's a big fucking dick to everybody, and we allow him to do it at our place of business. I, the manager, will now go back to behind the bar and do Bear's job for him because none of us want to tell him that he's a fucking dick. <laughs> so I said, yeah, Patrick, I'll take a bottle of water. So Patrick goes back there. Bear grunts because somebody's behind his bar. And uh, Patrick goes into the cooler and gives me a bottle of water. So I take it and I go to walk away and I open it and uh, it's open. It's in the cooler for sale, but it's open. Like I, there's no, there's no snap of the plastic when I open it. So I turn around, I go, this bar, this water's open. He goes, what do you mean? I go, it's open. I just opened it, but it doesn't, the plastic didn't break. This is the plastic's been broken on this already. It's been opened. It's, it's not sealed. He goes, you sure? I go, I, I know how to open a bottle of water. Yeah. <laughs> And he goes, oh, well, give it to me. And he gives me another one out of the, the cooler. And I open it, and it also is not sealed. It doesn't have a thing. And I go, I go, I think I may have made a mistake. He goes, why? I go, because this one didn't open either. This one, the plant. he goes, yeah, they just, that's just how they are. And I go, so you buy open water? And he goes, no, it's not open. You're just not detecting, you know, it's, you're probably snapping the plastic without knowing it. I went, uh, I go, well, I'm not going to go through your whole cooler, but that seems ridiculous. And he goes, well, I, you know, that's just the way it is. And I go, all right, well, do you want me to take the old one? He goes, no, I'll drink this one, which for some reason was good enough for me to prove that it wasn't poisoned, I guess. So I just took my water and I went in the back. But that's just fucking crazy, right? You, the plastic should snap. It should make a noise. I'm fucking nuts. I know I'm nuts. So uh, 930 comes along. I'm on stage and uh, I'm just about I had just started what is the final story of the show. So that's about. It could be 45 minutes. It all depends on how fast I talk. I started at 9.20. So uh, they flick the light on at 9.30. Kevin does from the booth. And I can see it. And I turn around and I nod at him. 
and I keep doing my show. And I'm talking, and it's going well, and I'm happy because the, the, the final story is hitting pretty hard, which is what I want. Because, um, again, I'm trying to get in shape for the CD, so I've got to trim the fat on it a little bit and make the show leaner, and, and which is happening. So 9.35 comes along, and Kevin, he flicks the light on and off like three times. And I see him, and I nod, and I keep talking. I do my show. Uh, so then there's a lot of activity to, my, to stage right which is where the door is. And I see Kevin leave and I'm still talking. And then Kevin comes in and he's got Patrick with him. And uh, pa Kevin goes in the booth and he starts clicking the light on and off where you can actually hear the switch. And Patrick starts waving at me. And I turn around and I nod and I keep doing my show. Because you know what? If you would have sat with me before the show, because there's a thing I do, all right, before I go into every theater, I sit down and I'll tell them, I go, listen to me. You know, I'm, I don't, because when I read them and I don't know how long it's going to go, I'll say it's about three hours, but it might be a little bit longer. These are the music cues. Here's the list. I mean, I sit down and I go through everything because people want to know. People that run a theater want to know. And I also tell them, hey, by the way, this is a clause I tell everyone. Uh, I'm going to make fun of you. I'm going to make fun of this room. But most of all, I'm going to make fun of myself. Everybody gets it. So I just want you to know it's not personal. It's just what I do. It's the way I work. He goes, great. So I'm on stage and I start making fun of W.C. Fields and I make fun of Groucho and I make fun of all of the fucking toys out in the lobby. I go, all this is, I go, this, you know who bought this place? A guy whose wife was tired of looking at Benny Hill in the garage. That's the only reason you buy this building. So I make fun of them and I make fun of the place and I fucking let them have it. So now 940, Patrick's in the room and they're flipping the light on and off. And I see him, but I'm not done. I'm not even close to done. I got at least 20 minutes of a story left. So I nod. And you know what? It's 20 to 10. I said I would be off by 10. Just because you said 930 doesn't mean I have to be off at 930. I paid to rent this room. I called you guys several times. You didn't answer your phone. And when I got here, all you cared about was your fucking check. You didn't come to me and ask me what I was doing or who I was or where I was or what the show was or anything at all about what the fuck I was doing because you're too jaded. You just think I'm a dumb fuck comedian who's going to show up, do my job, and fucking leave. That's not, that's not what I do. I come there. I do the show. I paid you to rent me a room to do. I understand you have a late show, but if, you got, if that's a real important... Because you know what their late show was? It's an improvised talk show featuring the guys who work at the club including Patrick, who plays the manager. He gets to come in. He's in that show because they're all improv guys who own the fucking joint, so they get to do improv all over the fucking place. They're improv everywhere, but only there. That's what they should change their name to. Improv everywhere, but only here. Well, I get that. And I was also told that their late show gets like five people to pay and come and see it. So I've got 50 people here drinking, watching me. If you're not happy making the fucking money, you should have told me beforehand. Which I guess technically Kevin did. And Max pointed that out to me later. He's like, dude, would you have gotten off if they were nice to you? I go, well, I would have done my show. And I go, but I'll be truly honest with you. If they would have been nicer to me, yeah, I think I would have thought more about it at 930. He goes, yeah, but you know, that's kind of fucked. That's their venue. You know, if, that, if that's their rules, I go, it's not their rules. I go, all Kevin said was, yeah, 930. Nobody said I had to be up by 930. And when I booked it, the guy that they chased the fuck out knew I was going till 10. If you want to double check with me when I come in and you know that I knew Bird or I booked it through a third party, then you come up to me and the next is like, well, why didn't you just go into them and tell them? And he's probably right. Two wrongs do not make a right. But I don't give a fuck. I'm happy to be a wrong. And yes, this makes me a dick. I mean, I, seriously, I am. It's their venue. I should have followed their rules. But if they would have been clear about their rules, it would have been fine instead of this passive-aggressive, yeah, 930, right? Well, fuck you and your TPS reports, Gary Cole. It's not going to be there on time. <laughs> so I'm on stage at fucking 20 to 10, and uh, they're flipping the light on and off, and I'm continuing to talk. And now Patrick is waving f frantically waving and then he throws his hands up and i hear him sigh because again the last story that i do in the show uh people have to pay attention to it so it, there's a lot of laughing in it but there's also in some moments where people are quiet and listening to me because i'm taking them somewhere and uh i hear him go ah, and he throws his hands up and he storms out and the best part was looking at him because he's this big dude he's about as big as me not as fat as me but he's kind of a big pasty he looks you know what he is he's the midwest in clothes he's fucking a big kind of paunchy pasty looking dude with that same feathered haircut everybody had senior year and he still got it 
And uh, so the best part is when he's kind of a big dude and when he threw his hands up in the air like, and he was all frustrated, he, you know what he reminded me of? Like an Italian chef in a fucking 50s show. Mamma mia! And he threw his hands in the air and he stormed off. And I kept talking. Kevin's in the booth and now Kevin is just, fr- he's just turning the light on and off now. And I can see him and I nod and I continue to do my fucking show. Patrick comes in again and he kind of approaches the stage like he takes a few steps and in my head I see him out of the corner of my eye and I'm thinking is he gonna come up here he's gonna come up here that'll be interesting I mean I can deal with it that'll be fine and it'll be funny I'll make it funny but I'm I'm I kind of I wanted him to come up on stage (laughs) that would have been fun um but the only thing is uh you know for me I can deal with it for people who paid to see me and are sitting on that side of the room they're completely distracted because all they see is this motherfucker flicking lights this motherfucker throwing his arms up and walking in circles and hemming and hawing and talking to his guy and they're talking about how to get me off fucking stage and you're distracting an entire half of the fucking room these people paid to get in here they're paying for your fucking drinks they're paying nine dollars for a bombay sapphire that's another thing some people told me afterwards they're like you know we went and got two drinks at the bar and they said you know this doesn't count against your two drink and then they charged him 18 bucks for two bombay sapphires and I, I laughed. I go, I, I didn't book. I, I didn't run this place. I'm sorry. But the people who are in the fucking room that you're distracting pay for those drinks. And they're paying for the fucking power in this place to keep the lights on so everybody can see your fucking Little Rascals color form set that you bought 13 years ago and you've got under glass. So you're fucking ruining it for half the people. I'm not. I'm doing a fucking show. They paid to see me. They didn't pay to say you come in and fucking throw your hands in the air and you to fucking play with a light switch. And I kept doing my show stomping around walking in circles doesn't know what to do he goes to kevin again because they're impotent what the fuck are they going to do unless they want to tackle me and take me off and i'm ready i'm waiting go ahead maybe that's why they didn't want to give me a microphone because they knew i'd have a weapon to use in the fight later (laughs) so i do my show i keep doing my fucking show and uh i i hit the end i hit the post on it at 1005 and I say thanks and everybody goes everybody's very nice they clap and we go crazy whatever I go in the back I go in the green room and I sit down and I'm furious I'm I'm fucking spent too because the show was two hours okay um so I cut a full hour out of it and uh and I'm sitting in the back and I'm still a little I'm still juiced from the show but also a little spent and uh time goes by and they're turning the room over with the fucking waitresses or whatever and and to get ready for the interactive talk show or whatever the fuck it is and again i don't mean to disrespect their show that's fine but work with me i paid you for the room you didn't pay me that's another thing if you pay me you can come to me with your rules but if i paid you then you need to come to me and see what my rules are too because i have a stake in this and again i could be completely wrong about this i was told by david that i was wrong and that's fine i get that and i don't expect you to think i'm wrong because you support you're you're not listening to the dumb fuck patrick and evil bear the bartender podcast you're listening to me so of course you're going to side with me kind of naturally but uh and i'm but i'm willing to see all sides of it but again the bottom line is i don't fucking care i paid they were dicks and that was that i did my show and that's what i was contracted to do in the mythical contract that never showed up so i'm in the green room and then mex comes back and he goes hey uh you ready to get out of here i go yeah i gotta he goes well there's people outside waiting for you i said i understand he goes uh what time are you supposed to be done I said, well, they said 9.30, but I told them 10. He goes, did you, uh, did you catch their act? I go, yeah, I saw him. I saw him the whole time. He's like, yeah, that was, that was pretty uncomfortable. Like, they were really making a scene. And I go, uh-huh, I know, I saw it. So he's like, oh, man. He goes, are you cool? And I go, I, I guess so. I said, I still got to meet with these guys before we split because I got to get my walk-up money and pay them their cash. And he goes, well, you got to propel outside the door here. And I go, okay. And they're turning over the room, and then Patrick comes in to the office to the green room i should say and he's holding paperwork and uh i'm ready i'm spoiling for the argument i'm waiting for him to fucking blast me because i mean it's going to be bad and so i'm i'm juiced i'm because i told you look i go into fucking convenience stores waiting to think who i'm going to fight now i'm in a green room and i'm waiting for this fucking italian chef to come in and just be like oh that's a spicy meatball out there and i'm ready to let him have it because again he never bothered to talk to me beforehand now you want to talk to me after so he comes in and he goes uh hey hi and i go hey he goes uh, so um you know do you have your check for me i said yeah 
And I go, uh, I'm sorry, it, it wound up later than you guys thought it would. I go, but I told Kevin it would be done around 10. I go, when I booked it with Bert, I said 10 o'clock. He goes, yeah, we've got a 10 o'clock show, so it, it's really hard for us to turn the room over. And I, and I, fuck you, you've got five waitresses. If they can't clear bottles in 10 minutes, I mean, what the fuck? And how much later is it going to be for people? You're not inconveniencing anybody. I've worked in comedy clubs my entire fucking life. You're a liar. But I don't say any of that because I'm waiting for him to, I, I've specifically told myself, hang back. Don't go after him. Yeah, he ruined the show near the end, in my opinion. But I'm going to wait for him to engage me, and then I'm going to fucking blow dry this guy. And he goes, yeah, well, you know, I, I thought I thought you were going to get off at 9.30. I said, no, I told Kevin 10. He goes, yeah, but Kevin says he told you 9.30. I said, yeah, and then I told Kevin 10. And there was silence in the air. And I think he realized, oh, I'm the manager. I'm supposed to handle those things, not Kevin, who gets microphones for people. So he kind of shut up, and he goes, yeah, well... You know, it makes it hard for us because we do have to turn over the room. I said, I understand that now. You've got people out there. But I did tell Bert 10 and I told Kevin 10. And I, I'm wait, I'm leaving it wide open like, hit me. Hit me. Please hit me. I'm sticking my chin out there. Hit me so we can do this. He goes, all right, well, you did have some walk-ups. And he gives me that. And he gives me the cash. And I pull out the check. And I go, well, who am I making this out to? And he tells me. So I start to write it out. I go, yeah, you know, I just, uh, I, I, I told you guys 10 o'clock. So everything was fine. He goes, yeah. He goes, did you tell your uh, people about the two-drink minimum? And I had not, uh, because it was a comedy club theater. I didn't. I didn't even think about it. I usually, I go, no, dude, I screwed that up. I go, I usually book theaters, so I don't. I don't generally do that. And he goes, oh yeah. He goes, yeah, you. Uh, you had some people who made some noise about it. I go, who? And he goes, well, there was a couple who they just they wouldn't. They said they absolutely refused to pay the two drink minimum. So finally, I told them, whatever. If that's how you want to do it, just get water or soda or something. And I said, okay, but did they did they buy water? He goes, yeah. I go, so then they paid the two-drink minimum. He goes, yeah, but they made a lot of noise about it. And it's like, you know, I wish you would have told them initially that they had a two-drink minimum. And I'm just like, I don't own those people. They bought tickets to see me. Everything else, you can deal with them. Don't make it look like I showed up here with 50 people in a bus. <laughs> you can tell them that they have to buy a two-drink. There's signs posted, and then that's fine. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, the thing is, I just, I go, all right, okay. So I wrote his check out, but he was all passive aggressive and never, he never led with it, with his chin. Like he was just, he, I, I, he never gave me the satisfaction of having the fight. So I wrote the check and I got the money. He's like, yeah, it was really nice to meet you. And I'm like, yeah, you didn't fucking meet me. Like I was just, it was just all phony because they just wanted me out of the fucking building. So I walked out and, uh, there were some people out there hanging out. Was going to go have pizza or not? And I sold some shirts. I met some people that took some pictures, which was great. And uh, then I went to split and I'm like, hold on, I got to I got to go talk to everybody. So Patrick was very busy portraying Patrick in the performance of Patrick is the manager in the other room. So I didn't get to talk to him. But uh, I did go say goodbye to Amy and I said goodbye to Angela and I said goodbye to fucking Jocelyn and um, Bear. I even went to talk to him and I waited and uh, I said, all right, Bear, take it off. Nice to meet you. <sighs> Grunted at me. Uh, because, you know, I made him stay 10 minutes later than he would have in real life, so he's pissed. And then I walked over to the owner named Dave, and he was with another woman at a table. And I said, I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to thank you for having me. And he's like, oh, how did it go? I said, I thought the show went well. I said, there were some communication issues. but And he said, yeah, well, you know, anytime you want to come back, let us know. We would love to work with you again. <laughs> and in my head, I'm just like, really? You should probably talk to Patrick before you start rebooking me into the club. <laughs> Because he's got a light switch to repair in the other fucking room. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, that guy was the only person, besides, you know, the, the girls who don't, they just work there. But anybody who had any sort of authority there, he was the nicest one because he's the owner. And it made me feel bad. Because it made me think that maybe, just maybe, this could be a successful place. Maybe, just maybe, they do like having improv and stand up under the same roof, and he really wants to show his memorabilia off, and maybe he is a huge comedy fan, and maybe he really does feel the comedians have something to offer. But unfortunately, he surrounded himself with dumb fucks who don't care, and all they do is chase the talent away. Mm -hmm, yeah. I've been in comedy clubs, and I've worked with people who are just marking time. And it's, look, I'll tell you what, I've worked with comedians who are just marking time. I've been one of those guys who's been at the late show and been like, oh man, I hope nobody shows up so we don't have to do a show. Fuck you, man. Fuck you. Because now I would kill to do comedy for a living. I would kill to work in clubs. Maybe not in clubs. I mean, you know what I mean? I would, I want to perform live for people who care. I, that's what I want to do more than anything. And it looked like this was a guy who genuinely enjoyed live performing. He was friendly to me and really nice. And it made me think I wanted to take him aside 
it actually made me want to take him aside and go, you know, you're killing it with the people you have working here because they're terrible. Like I would never want to come back to this place. And if you fought, they fought with two people over a two drink. I and mean, if you're nickel and diamond people over fucking 30 bucks, then I, I can't, I can't, I can't even talk to you. You don't care about the art. You're a business owner and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with being that person. But you need to recognize that it's business and entertainment colliding. And anybody who's entertainment did not get into it to have a boss. So when you start throwing your weight around and acting like you can give them fucking orders, it's always going to be a problem. There's always going to be friction. So he was really nice. And I talked to him and I split. Walked outside. And it was, it was snowing like a motherfucker. It was crazy snow. Like there was already probably two inches on the ground and it was coming down pretty heavy. So Max is like, dude, it hasn't snowed here in like a year. What did you do? And I said, I, I don't know. So we get to the car and I look at my phone and I get a phone call from Bert while I was working. I'm like, why the fuck would he call me? He knows I'm doing the show. It's crazy. I hope something bad didn't happen, but I can't call him now because we're trying to negotiate the snow and we're going to meet people for food. So we go to the pizza joint and uh, our friends KC and Melly showed up from Peoria, who also saw me in St. Louis. Our friend David from Indianapolis showed up. Uh, our friend James, who actually lives right there in Naperville, was there. And then uh, Judd and Nicole, who you may mention, uh, you may remember, I should say, I mentioned them. They flew out here, and we all had dinner at Animal, and they wouldn't eat the octopus. And uh, uh, So Judd and Nicole flew from Wyoming for the show in Chicago. <coughs> and uh, we all start talking about the experience, and they st all of them are like, did you see that guy? Did you see him all, that guy losing his mind? I'm like, yeah, I saw it, and I explained to them what happened. And... Uh, it was Casey and Melly who told me the story about the Bombay Sapphires for 18 bucks and that that wouldn't count against the two drink in the room. And then uh, Judd and Nicole, it turns out, were the people who wouldn't drink uh, because Nicole is pregnant. <laughs> Remember, she's naming the baby Mike. So she can't drink because we all need little Mike to be healthy. So that was what it was. It wasn't that they weren't going to observe the two drink minimum. She's like, I can't I can't drink because I'm pregnant. And, uh, and so then I guess it turned into a dust up where then finally they wound up paying for water and sodas. And, and she goes, I can't drink soda either. So they made me buy a bottle of, a bottle of water. And cause the guy, Patrick told me, he's like, yeah, they made a big stink about it. So we finally just went, okay, well, whatever. And they were just like, no, they made the stink about it. They were coming after us over the two drink and they kept coming over to the table. And I told them I'm pregnant. I can't drink. And again, like I said, if that just shows the difference between a club and people who are nickel and diming people for 30 bucks. It's like I paid you for the room and now you get a room full of 50 people drinking and you're getting all of that money. That's all you. You don't have to pay me a fucking thing. It just seems antithetical to the way to do business. So we all talk. We hang out. We had a good time. We ordered pizzas and um, I got gifts. People were nice. You know, Judd and Nicole gave me apple juice and Biscoff cookies for the plane. Aww. Which was really nice if you can't bring apple juice on the fucking plane because they'll make you dump it out. So, uh, but they brought, you know, a big thing of Biscoff cookies. Everybody was really cool. And uh, and I made sure everybody, I'm like, are you guys going home tonight? Because the whole time we were eating, it kept snowing. It kept snowing. We, had, we got about five or six inches overnight. Wow. And uh, we walked outside. Everybody was safe and everybody was cool. And then Mex and I drove home. And uh, I woke up Saturday in the house. We had work to do. But I grabbed my phone and I listened to the cell phone. It was Bert, Bert called me. He's like, hey, Mike, it's Bert. What's going on over there? Uh, give me a call when you get a chance. So that's mysterious because I know he was in Star of Rock and I don't know. He has nothing. He, how would he know? So I call him up. He answers the phone. I go, hey. He goes, hey. And he just starts laughing. I said, what's up? And he goes, what happened last night? And I said, nothing. I went and did the show and, and left. And I mean, nothing really. Why? They called me. I said, what do you mean they called you? Because they called me and they said, he won't get off stage. We don't know how to get him off stage. <laughs> and I started laughing. Are you fucking serious? He goes, yeah, they called me. I, I was at my show. My phone rings. It's them. And they're in a panic because you won't get off. And you told them that you, they said that you said before the show, you weren't going to go off until you wanted to get off stage. I go, that's bullshit. I told him by 10. I said, I'd be off by 10. And they go, yeah, but they said there's a 10 o'clock show. And, and, then, and they said that, and they said you were up there and you're ripping the club and you're making fun of them and you're making fun of all the memorabilia and you're making fun of everything that's outside and you're, you're saying it's a terrible place. I go, yeah, that's what I do. I make fun of everything in the building. <laughs> if one of them would have come up to me and talked to me, they would have fucking known what I was doing. <laughs> it's comedy. It's called comedy. And he just starts laughing. He goes, I, well, they, they were fucking freaked out. He goes, they told me they were going to fucking, they didn't know what to do if they had to go on stage and get you off because you were kind of holding the whole room hostage and you were taking it like, I go, hold them hostage. They paid to see me, motherfucker. Nobody paid to see them. Oh 
And he starts laughing. He goes, well, I don't know, man. He goes, they called me and they tried to figure out what I could do. They were like, can you call them? Can you do something? And I'm like, well, I'm going to take a phone call in the middle of the show. He said, yeah, they were panicked. They said you wouldn't get off their stage and they didn't know when you were going to. And you said you were just going to stay up there till you were finished. And I go, no, that's a lie. I said, I'd be done at 10. I go, they almost broke their light switch, flipping the light to fucking get me off stage. And then Patrick's on the side of the stage, throwing his hands in the air. He goes, oh, so Patrick was involved. I go, yeah, Dave was nice to me. I go, but Patrick was a fucking cunt. I go, he was just awful the whole time and ruined the whole half of that part of the show for me because he's off to the side of the stage and I can see him huffing and puffing and throwing his fucking fat arms in the air. And Burgess starts laughing and he goes, yeah, Patrick's the worst. I go, yeah, I found out. He goes, well. All right, I just wanted to find out what happened because they called me in the, in the middle of the night. And I go, well, I'm telling you what I told you then. And when I booked the show, I said I'd be done by 10. And I told them when I got there, I'd be done by 10. I was done by 5 after 10. So I don't think any change. I go, look, man, I am really sorry if I got you in trouble with these guys. And he goes, fuck them. I don't care. <laughs> Honestly, with the shit they put me through, this couldn't have ended better for me. So even though I was an asshole and maybe I would taken things into my own hands, it turns out I did the right thing, folks. <laughs> and uh, and let me tell you something, though. I'm sure that you guys can relate to Kevin because when in this show starts to get into the off hours, I'm sure you're flicking light switches at your fucking house <laughs> trying to get me to stop talking. But let me tell you, right now, if you're home and you're flipping your light switch, I just nodded at you. <laughs> you guys can get me at Mike and Mike Schmidt comedy dot com. You guys can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash the 40 year old boy. You can be my friend at facebook.com slash the 40 year old boy. You can be our friend David Hernandez's friend at facebook.com slash David Max Hernandez. Uh, you can follow our friend Lily Von Stupp at two Twitter accounts twitter.com slash Lily Von Stupp and twitter.com slash MNTs. Uh, and if you want to be your friend at Facebook, go to facebook.com slash Lily Von Stupp. And if you want to write her a personal note, if you want to weigh in on Poncho versus no Poncho, here's my vote no Poncho. You can write her a personal note at lily at burlesque411.com. That's lily, L-I-L-I, at burlesque411.com. Remind you folks about the Monday Night Tees every Monday night at the three clubs on Santa Monica and Vine. Those are the cross streets, folks. It's not on Santa Monica and on Vine. That would be weird. It's at the corner of Santa Monica and Vine. Uh, the Monday Night Tees, the longest running, sexiest, hottest burlesque show in the history of Los Angeles. I'm lucky enough to know the producer of that show, and you're lucky enough to have her sitting here right now. Lily Von Stoop. Hey, Lily. Hi. How are you? I'm that's good news. Poncho is off right now, folks. Just letting you know. If you want a poncho update, poncho's off. Hashtag poncho's off. Um, so how was the show this week? The show was fantastic. Yes, I was, uh, well, you did, yeah, I was gone. I was out of town and I had to see some updates about it online. I was in, uh, I was sitting in a hotel room in Milwaukee at that time and uh, wondering why I could not go. You've just invited me to some shows and I don't think I can go. Um, Mel Brooks and stuff like that. So who was at the show this week? Everybody I was cares. Hosting. I was hysterical. Well, that's good. You were on? <laughs> um, no, uh, Nikita, uh, not Nikita, um, uh, fuck, uh, Duchess of Courage performed, uh, there, there was just a bunch of great performers. It was an all-around great show. Did awesome. You pick up with me? We How was the on. crowd? Crowd was fantastic. There was another second week in a row, 40-year-old boy fans showed up. No way. These people, this one actually came up and identified himself. The other one had to be outed by, by a friend really? next to them. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but, uh, no one wants to admit they listen to this Pardo? show. Is that what I said his name was? Pardo. He oh, showed up? Pano. Oh, Pano. P-A-N-O. P-A-N-O. Pano. Pano. He's a, yeah. of German, From Germanic Germany. descent. Yes. He came and uh, took a picture with me and was so cute because he said the show was actually funnier than I thought it would be. 
And I was like, well, what did you just expect? Hot girls to just walk around? And I'm like, does Mike sell it too hot? Yeah, I want it to be hot. That's what I'm looking for. Well, it is, but it was really, it was Hey, funny. I'm funny. Sweet. You know, I don't need hot girls to be funny. I'm funny. I got all the funny in the room. I don't need any of you hot girls to chime in. You do the hot thing because I got none of that. All I got is funny. Together we'll rule the world. Uh, well, good. So Pano was there, and that sounds like it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Did he smack your ass to get in free? Absolutely not. He what? Was very respectful and nice, and he was so cute. May I take a picture with you? And I'm like, of course you can. So I handed the camera off, and then I pulled my bra out. Whoa. I'm like, Stupid. Took your poncho <laughs> off. Poncho's off, Pano. That's right. Pano's off. Pano's off. <laughs> Pano's off or Pancho's off. Yeah. Uh, well, good. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad people showed up, and that was fun. And there's a show this week. Is it a theme show? There is. Who would it be? I love Mel Brooks. This is Mel Brooks. This is what I was just talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would love to go to that show. I don't think I can this Monday. Exactly. Um, we have a brand new act. We have That's Life. Life Stinks. Life stinks yeah, Life stinks. Life, life stinks. life Stinks has one of my favorite scenes in a Mel Brooks movie. Which one? Um, it is, it is, it's completely stupid. Okay. Uh, he winds up in a homeless shelter, and he and Jeffrey Tambor are sitting there with Howard Morris. And Howard Morris has a piece of corn in the corner of his mouth. And Mel Brooks goes, you got a little something on your face. And so... Howard Morris goes to brush it off and they continue eating and then you get another camera shot and now the corn is on the other side of Howard Morris's mouth. And Mel Brooks is like, hey, uh, you, got a, you got a thing, I'm telling you. And so Howard Morris goes to clean it off and they continue to eat and Mel Brooks looks up and now the corn is on his cheek. <laughs> I, I love the dynamics of writing the scene. I love the dynamics of filming it because then it's on his cheek and he goes, you, dude, I told you, you've got, so he does like a curly, like he wipes his whole face off and they continue eating and he looks up and the corn is like on his forehead. So he goes, I get it. Mel Brooks goes, you got it. So they keep eating. There's dialogue. They're talking. And then another guy comes and sits down and he goes, hey, guys. And he starts talking and he looks at Howard Morris. He goes, you got a little something on your face. And Howard Morris just gives the meanest look to Mel Brooks. It's fucking like he blames him, even though he told him three times and he's got this fucking magic corn that we can't get off his face. But it's so subtle because like, hey, you got something? Brushes it off. Hey, you got a little something? No, it's still there. Now nah, you're good. Now you're good. And then a guy, another, and at the best part, they're all hobos. So then another hobo goes, hey, got a little something there. He's mad that another hobo saw his hobo face with corn on it. I love it. Love that scene. Like I said, I loved, I just love the dynamics of thinking of it and writing it. It's fucking awesome. He, does, he did the moving mole in History of the World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did the moving hump. It's perfect. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah, he, he likes. I love Mel Brooks. There you go. And Monday you'll prove it. Yes. Are you dancing? I am. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, what, what movie do you have? <laughs> that's a joke i'm kidding i'm having fun uh so that's your go see lily's signature routine of uh the i'm tired routine from lily von stuff so go see that this monday at the three clubs on santa monica and vine tickets are on sale at brownpapertickets.com tickets are also available if you go to mondaynighttees.com it'll give you a link probably to brown paper but i mean you know <laughs> so go ahead and go to mondaynighttees.com and check it out and uh are tickets on sale for other shows coming up yes through the end of February. All right. So through the end of February, folks, make some plans, come out on some Mondays and enjoy yourselves. Have a good time there at the uh, show. It should be fun. It's exciting. Perhaps you'll see me because I'm in town for all of February. I'm not going anywhere. But uh, come March, I am gone forever. Literally, I'm gone every week in March. It's crazy. Um, so go to the Monday Night Tees. Go to MondayNightTees.com and go to BrownPaperTickets.com. Uh, and I will tell you this, just as a little sneak preview, uh, Lily Von Schupp has a Friday show now. Mm-hmm. Also at the Three Clubs. It's a happy hour show called Friday Night Happy Hour. Friday Night Happy Hour show every Friday night at the three clubs on Santa Monica and Vine starting at 8 o'clock. And uh, are tickets on sale for that just yet? They are, and they are on sale half price Folks, the end of February. two for one. Half price seats through the end of February for the beginning of Friday Night Happy Hour, Friday, March 1st. Yes. And uh, tickets are on sale for that now. Again, if you go to brownpapertickets.com and you plug in Lily Von Stupp's name, you will get all of this information and buy tickets to all of these events. So please do that. Go to facebook.com slash the 40-year-old boy and be my friend, like I said. And also there are plenty of pages you can join to bring me to your town. Montreal still exists. Hampton Roads, Virginia exists. Who else? There was another big... uh, Big place that wants me to go there. I forget who it is, but whatever. There are plenty of pages there to come to your town. If you want to start a page for me to come to your town, go ahead and do that. You should probably ask me first because I might not want to come to your town. Uh, but if, hell, if people buy tickets, I don't give a fuck. I'll come to your town. Uh, just make sure everybody named Patrick is out of your town at the time. <laughs> Um, so start a page, contact me if you want to start a page. That's exciting. But I have live dates coming up, as you know. Like I said, I'm here for all of February, and I'm going to try to do some stand-up stuff here 
uh, in California. Nothing more telling you about. It's all just practice spots and short spots. Um, if you'd like to see me, I will be on the road. I'll be in San Antonio, Texas at the Woodlawn Black Box Theater. That's March 2nd. And then the following week, March 9th, I'll be in Detroit at the Box Theater, technically Mount Clemens, Michigan, just a little further outside of Detroit. Um, so that'll be a lot of fun. Come to see me in San Antonio on March 2nd. Come to see me in Detroit slash Mount Clemens on March 9th. Those are both Saturday shows. And then please remember that I'm in Portland, March 29th, Portland at the Headwaters Theater, the Black Box Theater there, and tickets are on sale for that. And I will be in San Francisco recording my first ever CD April 5th. That's Friday night, 8 o'clock. That show will be there. I'll be ready. Get some tickets. Hey, there was a big flood of people buying tickets for that, and then it stopped. So if you're going to come to San Francisco, buy some tickets. And if you're going to buy tickets for Mount Clemens, I talked about it last week. They're, you know, Portland, these are kind of slow, man. And they're coming up within a month. So San Antonio had a nice little burst and, and that's cool. But if anybody could, is going to come see me and everybody was not very nice on Facebook. They're like, dude, I'm waiting for my tax return check. I'm waiting for all these things. And I understand that. Uh, I'm just throwing it out there that, you know, the sooner you buy tickets, then uh, the more sleep I get. Because otherwise, I'm just like, Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? Because, ha you know, what happened in Chicago, I had only served a certain amount, and then I sold 12 the last day. You know what I mean? So that late surge is always fun, and then there's walk-ups and stuff, but I kind of like to have a general idea of what's happening. Uh, it, it helps with the planning, and that's cool. So thank you. Come out to those shows. Go to brownpapertickets.com and put in Mike Schmidt or the 40-year-old boy, and you will find all of these dates available. Links are also available on my Facebook page, but if you want to find them centrally located, brownpapertickets.com is the place to be. Buy some tickets. Come out to the show. Have have a good time. Meet me. I'll have shirts for sale. We'll have pictures to take. And uh, I'm not finding a place to eat in your town. I found one in my town. That's up to you guys. Go to MikeSchmidtComedy.com <laughs> and go to the Joe Business page for all the stuff that we have to offer. Uh, always the autographed prints. Uh, I will be sending out Rich and Mark's uh, prints this week. I just got back into town. Oh, and guess what? I forgot to bring them again to get signed by Lily. God damn it. Um, I will get them signed by Lily and I will get them sent out to you post haste very soon. Someone ordered a shirt while I was on the road. I am in town now, so I will get your shirt sent out to you. Thank you so much for that order. I do appreciate it. Uh, shirts, Red Boy and Scar Panda are available. Sizes extra large through small. Uh, like I said, the autographed prints are available. Any of the explosions of id or prints that you've seen from the show will be autographed by me, by David Hernandez, the artist, and by Lily Von Stupp, the amazing producer. Uh, mugs are available through uh, Zazzle.com. There's the Thorgar and Yeep mug and then the Fireboy mug. There's autoerotic asphyxiation earbuds and conquering watches available through tweakedaudio.com slash 40. Always go to tweakedaudio.com slash 40 for all of your autoerotic asphyxiation earbud needs. I understand there's some rival companies starting their autoerotic asphyxiation earbuds. No, thank you. <laughs> Tweaked is the only place you want to go if you want to listen to great music while you're strangling yourself and jerking off at the same time. And also wearing a cock ring watch to get really too messy. It's amazing. All right, so uh, what else do we have on that page? We've got the download sets, year one, year two, year three, year four, or... Uh, go ahead and be like Maureen Boyle. Get the podcast of the Caribbean sets. You've got a ton of me. All of my, all of the air I've ever spoken into will be sent right to you, and you can download it there on your computer. Uh, that's called the podcast of the Caribbean set, and it is year one through four, available for the price of three. Schmitty Comes Alive is a download of the live show I did at the LA Podcast Festival. $5 audio download. Download it now. Hear me talking and uh, see exactly what I do. Because I'll tell you what, that show, the uh, that, that hour and a half show, it is exactly what I would give to somebody. And I will tell you this, someone came to the show in Scott Gerwitz, a listener, Scott Gerwitz, he wrote me and said, hey, I want to buy the download of Schmitty Comes Alive because you say it's the perfect representation of who you are. Uh, I would like to get it for somebody else who I'm bringing to the show who has never seen you. So they will be able to hear that and then come see the live show. And I said, done. And you know how good a guy Scott Gerwitz is? He had already bought himself the $5 download and then still went ahead and purchased it again for somebody else. He could have given them his. He could have pirated it. He could have loaned it. He could have done whatever, which quite frankly, probably I would have done. Certainly in my younger days, like a Scott Gerwitz, a strapping young man, but nicely he went ahead and bought the download set and had me send it to a different email address. And then that person listened. She came to the show and she liked them both, shockingly enough. Maybe she's listening now. Maybe I've won her over. Although now that we're into year seven or year six and hour five, I don't know if she's around. <laughs> year five, year five and hour four. Jesus Christ. Um... So go to the Joe Business page and check out all that stuff. While you're at the website, check out the Explosions of Id page because it's awesome. I think it's fun. And, uh, and now I'm going to let Lily stretch her back in her hip and get the fuck out of her house because I have been here since the afternoon and we talked for two hours. Because again, we're, we're old chums. We haven't seen each other in a while. So I had to hear some burlesque news and she had to hear news of my life and the road. 
As a matter of fact, I told her everything that I just told you, but I told her before the show. That was why our conversation lasted two hours. <laughs> I told her the whole thing and then made her sit here and let's do it a second time because that's the kind of boss I am, folks. I'm not the boss of her, I know. Um, I got to go home and juggle my DVR because all my yellow dots are going to expire. It's so terrible. I uh, I came home. It's so funny. I told you guys I booked $133 airfare from Mil- to, to Milwaukee. Well, I had to fly to Cleveland and then Cleveland with this layover and then I had to fly to Milwaukee. Then when I flew home, I had to fly from Milwaukee to Denver I had a two and a half hour layover in Denver and then I had to go from Denver to LA. So already that's inconvenient because of the time, but I was like, Oh, well I'm saving money. Well then from Milwaukee to Chicago, I wound up on Amtrak and then I wound up at David's house as he picked me up. But then in order to get back to the train station, uh, you know, I had, I was flying out of Milwaukee at like one o'clock in the afternoon. So I had to be at the airport at 11. So I had to get to Milwaukee by 11 AM. So that would mean I would have to take the train on Tuesday morning. The early the, the train I would have to take, I would have had to leave David's house at 5 a.m. and get a cab to the train station and then take a train from his house to Chicago to Union Station and then take a train from there to Milwaukee. And I didn't want to leave at 5 a.m. because his, you know, his kids are sleeping. So then I would have had to get up, try to grab a shower and pack, wake everybody up before they've got to be up for school. It's just a fucking hassle. So I said to him, I go, Hey man, can you get me to the train station on Monday? And he said he might be able to, but unfortunately my godson was ill. So he was going to have to be with him. And he goes, maybe I could throw him in the car and get you to the local station, but he couldn't get me to Chicago, but I'm not going to have my godson in a car schlepping me around in the cold because I need to get to the train. It was just, it was fucking ridiculous. Again, I bought this ticket cause it was like 133 bucks, but I didn't think of the logistics. My time is worth much more than that. And everybody else's time. I don't want to start making people shuttle me around and take me here and there and all this fucking bullshit. So then I wound up leaving on Monday. I just left myself on Monday, Monday morning, because Sunday night we we were up flipping channels, and then he was like, I'm going to bed. And then I went to go to sleep, but I couldn't sleep because I was trying to still figure out the train thing. And then finally I went, you know what, fuck it. I'm just going to go early in the morning. I'm going to leave. So I got up, and David's wife was up, and she said, what are you doing? I said, well, i got to call a cab and go to the train station. She goes, I can take you to the train station. I go, no, that's okay. You're going to work. She goes, I drive right past it. It's fine. So she did. She took me at 7 a.m. I stayed, I stayed up all night. I didn't sleep. And then she took me at 7 a.m. to the local train station. So then I had to take a local train station, the Express, to Chicago, to Union Station, and grab a train there to go to Milwaukee, to the airport. So it was nice of her to give me a ride. You know, you know what it was? Fuck it. It was planes, trains, and automobiles. That's what my Monday was. It was actually automobiles, trains, and plane. But it, it was the same fucking thing. I should have been in the back of a fucking pickup truck with Steve Martin. It was ridiculous. <laughs> And it ruined my trip. I fucking ruined my trip because, you know what, I thought I was saving money on airfare, but I'll tell you what, folks, uh, when I flew out, I had to get a fucking hotel room, and then I, I came back on a train, and then I took two trains up, and then I had to get a hotel room because I, I, I was leaving on Tuesday, so I went Monday, to, and I stayed the night over because I didn't want to fucking hassle with anybody. Between two hotel rooms, three train rides, I, I ate up any money I possibly could have saved on there, and I wasted fucking 50 hours thinking about it. I fucking ruined the trip. <laughs> So she took me to the train station, dropped me off. I had to take an express. And here was the thing. My, the, the train was at 740, and it got to Union Station at 815. And then I was taking the 825 to Milwaukee to get there by 1040. Uh, well, so we start driving. Everything's fine. Everything's okay. It's an express. It doesn't stop until it does because it was snowing that morning, and it stopped. And the second it stopped, I go, I'm fucked. Sure enough, I get to Union Station at 825. I get in line at Amtrak and I'm pissed. And uh, there was a woman behind the counter. I go, hey, can I just ask you one question? She goes, I'm in the middle of something, sir. I said, I have one question. And she turned around and ignored me. And I was like, fuck. So I waited in line till they called me up and I go, did I miss the 825? She goes, yep. And I said, all right, I, what do I take? And she goes, well, there's an 11 o'clock. You can take that. And I go, do I have to buy? And she goes, no, you got your ticket. You're fine. So now I'm, I'm late over. It was like 1040. So I'm late over now for two hours in the train station. Look, I didn't want to be late over in an airport, but at least it's warm. And it's not full of the people who take the fucking train. Because the train is just transporting the indigent. Seriously. I, I mean, there's a reason the Nazis used trains. And it was to demoralize everybody because they knew. So I, I was waiting and I'm sitting there and I'm flipping through my phone and then the people who take the train start to drift in and they've got garbage bags full of clothes and, and p- 
pillows with the dirty pillowcases. I mean, it was just fucking horrible. And I know I'm like, I got to get on the train with these people and they're starting to mass up. And then there's no, there's no law on the train. There's nobody being polite to one another. They're like, all right, we're going to start boarding in 10 minutes. Everybody like runs for the fucking front. And I'm like, well, I can't be caught sitting next to somebody and I don't want to not have a window seat. I just need to get in there and relax. So I get up and I'm kind of lurking myself. There's a guy in shorts It's fucking four degrees outside. He's wearing shorts and flip-flops. He's getting on the train holding a garbage bag full of clothes. I mean, just just these awful people, just terribly unwell off, if that's such a thing, non-rich, whatever you want to call them. So they say, please get in a single file line. So we do, and they go to board the train. So I go walking out to get on the fucking 1040 train, and I haven't slept, okay? So I'm walking to the train, and I'm right behind an old couple, and they are... The only thing they're missing are, are is a walker with tennis balls on it because they are so slow and they are holding everybody up. And the thing is, there's two doors that we're all heading for. So I'm wondering, why is there one line if there's two doors? So I don't, I'm just, I don't care. Just get me on the fucking train. So we're walking and all of a sudden alongside me, people start to pass me. Like a woman walks by me and a guy walks by me. They start cutting the line. So the old people are walking slowly. I'm behind them. Two people pass. So I go, fuck it. So I go to pass them. And as I walk... This guy turns around, this older gentleman looks at me and he goes, why don't you just wait in your place? And I said, excuse me? And he goes, why don't you stay in line? It's a single file line. That's a, she said, stay in your place. And uh, I'd been up all night and two other people had gone by and he didn't say a fucking word to them. So I just went, shut up, old man. <laughs> and... I, I will admit, I thought of it just before I said it because I knew it was the wrong thing to do, but I was fucking pissed that he was yelling at me instead of the other two people. So I'm going to go, shut up, old man. And he just looks at me like wide-eyed and I just kept walking and I got on the train and I'm just like, you know what? The train turned me into them. <laughs> Literally three train rides and you become the kind of person who rides the train <laughs> and who curses out old people. <laughs> Next time you see me, I'm going to have flip-flops and a garbage bag full of my clothes. <laughs> And I'm going to be fucking scolding people for passing me. It was awful. I'm going to have a dirty pillow with a dirty pillowcase. Oh, my God. I just All I could think of was the fucking train full of bed bugs. Whenever I saw these people carrying their pillows, I'm like, you have brought bed bugs back into my life. God damn it. And I took it all out on the... Oh, shut up, old man. It was brutal. It was wrong. I know it was wrong, but I didn't fucking care. I was like so mad he didn't yell at those other people. It was inconsiderate. It was... Well, it was fucking rude. Well, it was terrible. He's lucky I didn't fucking hit him. because I have a tone. Because you know why? Because I talk quickly and I don't I don't fucking think. That's why. I think that's what it means when you have a tone. Is you don't fucking bother to care what comes flying out of your goddamn mouth. I try to grow the show and I want people to get on board and they're like, eh, I listen to it and you talk too fast. Really, I talk too fast. How the hell else am I supposed to cram all of this into a small three-hour window? Dude, this is there's no script. I just go with this shit on the fly. It makes me laugh. If it doesn't make you laugh, turn the fucking station. And by turn the station, I mean turn the wheel of your car right into a guardrail. Jesus, fuck.
Hey, where are you, where are you going, boy, 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 boy?